Welcome to the Future of Life Institute podcast. My name is Gus Docker. I'm here with Dan Hendricks. Dan got his PhD in computer science from UC Berkeley, and he's now the, the director of the Center for AI Safety. Dan, welcome to the podcast. Hi, nice to be here. You have a fascinating paper about evolution and AI and humanity's relation uh, with, with AIs in the future. It's called Why Natural Selection Favors AIs Over Humans. Maybe you could just sketch what that pace, uh, paper is basically about. Sure. So I think what I'm trying to do with that paper is point at some robust processes that are shaping AI's development. And if we can say that these processes are relevant, then we can say a lot of things about what AI systems might end up being like and their key properties in relation to humans. So maybe it's most effective to sort of start with a, a sketch of uh, some of the scenarios I might have in mind. So right now, it looks like we're in an AI race in the corporate sphere. Basically, we've got companies like Microsoft against Google, against other new competitors like Elon's organizations, potentially there'd be new ones as well, like Amazon. And what's also happening is that there are pressures to be automating or outsourcing more and more uh, tasks to different AIs. So we might use AIs to write our emails right now or generate some art. Later, they might, we might even not just have them generate the email, but maybe they'll automatically write many of the less critical emails for us. We could imagine this process continuing all the way up to outsourcing more and more important decision-making tasks to different AI agents. And then eventually we could have AI systems do things like be CEOs of companies where they're for being a CEO, it's often a game of stamina and knowing how to do a lot of different little things. And it's possible that they could be more competitive. If we'd imagine that there'd be companies that would resist these sorts of trends that wouldn't try and outsource anything to AIs, wouldn't, wouldn't replace people with uh, AI systems, then they just might simply be outcompeted and become irrelevant. If they try and bargain with these larger trends, they end up losing influence. And so what they have to do is they have to align with that process. So we can see that this process is shaping the goals and directives of lots uh, or of a key part of society. And we're outsourcing more power and decision making to AI agents. So whereas a lot of other stories might say um, we've got some AI system and it's going to try and seize power or something, go from being relatively powerless to very powerful. Actually, we might <laughs> just end up giving them a lot of the power by, by default. And then there's a hope that we can keep that process in control. But we can imagine in, in later stages of this process, we've got AI CEOs. And this isn't terribly implausible, I should say. For instance, NetDragon Websoft, which is a large video game company in China, uh, had a press release where they're looking to have uh, an AI CEO. So I think this is a, um, a possibility uh, um, definitely in time. Do you think that's that's more of a gimmick or do you think that's I more think it's of more of a gimmick currently. Uh, yeah, I think it's more of a gimmick currently. It still is a larger company, but... Um, uh, nonetheless, it's, there isn't a only humans can be in control of companies or uh, there, there doesn't seem to be any precedent like that. Eventually, uh, we may be having AIs directly interacting with other AIs. They're making uh, they're they're communicating with each other. They're uh, interacting and competing with each other in this sort of marketplace. We have more survival of, of the fittest dynamics. And I think. When we have survival of the fittest dynamics, then we end up getting uh, stronger selection pressures for, for AI agents that have more survival instincts. So things like self-preservation, things that are better at amassing their power, things that aren't um, know when to say the right thing in the right situation, but they might be a little deceptive in some other types of situations. They might not always think to uh, follow the law, but they might think, let's break the law if we don't, are likely not to get caught, or if we do get caught, we can take the penalties. Um, we, can, we can take the fine. Uh, and that might be a more efficient strategy in competing in this sort of system. So I think there's some selection for um, uh, generically more, quote unquote, selfish behavior where um, agents end up propagating themselves or expanding their influence at the expense of other agents. And when they're interacting with each other, I think this gets more intense. Society get become moves substantially more quickly. Uh, it's harder for humans to keep up. So they have to keep outsourcing more of this power to these, these AI agents if they're to have any influence whatsoever. In this process, 
people might not like where it's going. And as I said, they would have incentives to keep aligning with it. The ones who have misgivings end up losing relevance. But what uh, might also happen is uh, we might get more dependent on them too in this process so that if we want to get rid of them um, or want to reduce our influence, it's not really that much of an option. We might become more dependent on them for our basic needs. We've enmeshed them in a lot of key decision making. We've forgotten how to do various things. Uh, they're, they're in control of our power grid. We've even become potentially, in some cases, emotionally dependent on them. They've propagated to a private sphere, and a lot of people are having these as, as chatbot friends. It's, um, so as they get more integrated into our processes, it becomes very difficult to reverse this process, too. Uh, so um, if there's a lot of momentum to it and uh, if there isn't, isn't sufficient willpower for reversibility, then we've got a problem. Think of, for example, the internet. The internet was not designed with safety or security in mind. We would all like a much safer internet, but of course, um, it's not really feasible for us to just, okay, well, let's stop the internet and we'll just rewrite it from scratch to be a safer thing. Uh, we'll end up, uh, we'll, we'll just keep rolling with it. What might, um, so I get concerned at that later stage where they're, it's moving extremely quickly, where there's a lot of intense competition among them. And I think that provide some sort of alignment towards some um, pressures that are not um, in keeping with um, human well-being. Evolution is not doing the same thing as maximizing well-being. It's quite a, quite a different quite a different force. Um, why, why talk about evolution? So, so why is it that, that we're talking about evolution or that you're writing about evolution is that in this paper? This sounds more like market forces pushing in directions that we might not like. Where, how seriously should we take the evolution part? Is it, is it more metaphor analogy or is it more literal? Uh, so this this is this is more literal. We can we can speak about it in a in a formal sense. Uh, I'm speaking about uh, evolution on this time scale because um, we would have. <clears throat> I, I'm not speaking about biological evolution. Biological evolution for humans is slow. For some other organisms like fruit flies, it can be fairly fast. But for uh, humans, it's slow. Other sorts of structures evolve substantially more quickly. Uh, so for instance, um, uh, software and, and things like that, those change substantially more quickly. And so I think AI agents as well, and there are many basic characteristics, uh, could change dramatically over the course of a year. And there might be a lot of competition that would affect what they would end up looking like. So I think because their adaptation, uh, since they can adapt and adjust their weights, uh, uh, every few seconds since they can um, uh, compete with each other uh, very quickly and there'll be a lot of iterations there, then I think that the time scales end up getting, uh, the, the pressures end up getting so intense that it starts to make sense to not just talk about it as uh, two fixed things competing with each other, but instead uh, paying mind to how this, uh, these continual rounds of competition end up affecting their strategies and end up, uh, end up influencing how they behave. So in short, the, this, the, the idea is we progressively outsource more and more decision making to them. We get increasingly dependent on them. They start interacting with each other more directly. That produces some survival of the fittest sorts of dynamics. And that tends to select for more selfish behavior. Now, when I'm saying selfish behavior, I'm not talking about intentions or anything like that. I'm not saying that they're necessarily trying to be ruthless. A lot of people in market in the market, for instance, when they're laying off a thousand people, they're not thinking, ah, I'm being selfish. They're thinking, I'm being efficient. I'm doing my job. Um, so it, this isn't necessarily that they're um, thinking to displace things. Indeed, things that aren't even conscious can be selfish. For instance, AI technologies now are, uh, or when they're automating people, are propagating themselves and things like them at the expense of humans. So they don't even need to be conscious for this uh, for this to be um, uh, for us to call them uh, selfish. Whether they intend it or not, that doesn't really matter. It's more that they just have those sorts of behaviors. So that's at least what it might look like in a in the corporate sphere. For the military, a sort of military uh, example would be: Let's imagine we're in a great power conflict. And we get a fairly similar process. We uh, have AI agents doing a lot of our bidding. They're uh, necessary. Um, they're strategically relevant. Things are moving so quickly. People can't make appropriate, uh, make appropriate strategic decisions in time. So we have to outsource much of it to them. 
Uh, it's also substantially more politically convenient to have AIs um, fighting instead of uh, instead of people getting uh, killed in that process. Um, so we we end up having AIs AIs um, uh, fighting against each other, and that creates some unfortunate selection pressures for the uh, for ones that we. Um, uh, for uh, ones that are better able to propagate their information, um, better able to survive. So at, uh, my concern is that we might lose control of that process where we can't get AI systems to be extremely reliable or control them. And we have, we have, this, uh, we have this process going on where they're competing with each other. Eh, it may make sense for uh, rational, self-interested actors to continue with this. If they don't, then they're going to be destroyed by the other country. And so they might uh, put all of humanity at risk by um, creating this crucible in which uh, AI systems are being shaped. And uh, we might lose control of that process. And that could result in potentially omnicide of everyone. But um, uh, it may have made rational sense for self-interested actors to um, to do that, because a lot of those just leaders may have um, may have been um, disempowered or destroyed if they didn't um, go along with um, having AIs uh, uh, outsourcing lots of lethal decision making and to giving them uh, automatic retaliation abilities. If they didn't do that, then they would lose necessarily. So we've got we basically got a collective action problem um, is, is what I'm emphasizing here and some other communities that might call this Moloch. We've got a collective action problem. And then also we have a very fast moving environment where the individual agents end up changing their shape fairly quickly, such that we can start to see them having different behaviors um, uh, being selected for. So um, th those are those are two different uh, two different scenarios I have in mind. Yeah, I think one sticking point for people or for listeners here might be the move from from the tools we have today, from the from GPT, uh, Chat GPT we use, or an, a recommendation algorithm when we watch YouTube or something like that, to more uh, of AI agents. How do you see that move happening? Yeah, so I should say the paper was largely written last year, but I sort of waited until. Um, there'd be more of an arms race type of dynamic going on so, um, so that people would go, oh, it's much more plausible. But, uh, so yeah, so I think, I think there are some different ingredients we need. We need um, intense competition and we need variation. I think a lot of the interesting dynamics do start to happen when they become more autonomous and have more of these lifelike characteristics for this analogy or for this, the, the characterization of evolution to feel more natural. Um, it's a little less natural for people to think of other structures evolving, such as, say, cultural artifacts or, say, scientific theories or designs. That's uh, appropriate to say, too, though, but it certainly is less natural compared to if we're thinking that they're more lifelike. So if we're imagining that they're AI agents, it, it, it does become more natural. In the case of AI agents, it's not clear when we'll have that. Right now, they are more tool-like there are still plenty of people trying to make them be more agent-like to complete various different tasks. So there are things like auto GPT, uh, where people are trying to repurpose models such as GPT-4 to behave as agents. They don't particularly work well now. There's the Transformers Agents Library that recently came out, but uh, there still are some capabilities needed for that to really kick into high gear. I wouldn't want to be... Um, Putting this on people's attention after <laughs> um, we're already in the in a more critical uh, situation, so um, it isn't uh, isn't to say that it isn't applicable now, but it becomes more worrying and more intense and uh, more legibly shapes its uh, shapes their evolution uh, when they're agents. Yeah. So this idea of extending evolutionary theories to other domains uh, apart from biology is, is, is extremely interesting. But do you think there's a risk that we might um, bend the domain we're trying to, to theorize about into shape to, to make it fit the, the evolutionary framework? I'm thinking that perhaps, uh, perhaps not everything fits into the, to the evolutionary frame in a sense. Why, why, why do you think AI development is a good fit for, for evolutionary theory? It basically depends on the intensity. Many structures can evolve, but if there isn't much intensity for it, then it isn't as applicable. I should say, at least right now, there are four instances, most of the artificial selection going on for AI agents is to make them better at basic, better at propagating themselves. And as it happens at the expense of others, basically they're designing them to automate people as much as possible. 
So I think that most of the ways in which people are um, directly shaping AI systems now are exactly in a sort of disempower, replace humans direction um, to a first order approximation. Uh, but um, the evolution is applicable or the sort of more generalized notion of Darwinism is applicable when we have three conditions, and those would be called the Lewontin conditions. When we have variation in the different agents, when we have retention, so between two iterations of agents, they have some similarity. They're not anticorrelated or completely dissimilar across time. And then there needs to be differential fitness or there need to be fitness differences so that some end up propagating at higher rates than others. And so if we have all three of those conditions, then we have evolution by natural selection occurring. So that shows that it is a risk factor and it is shaping their development. And then I'd be concerned about that because evolution doesn't select for things that are um, extremely nice necessarily. It's more, <laughs> um, uh, instead it selects for things that are better at propagating themselves. This lesson might be worth, uh, worth stating again. Maybe you could talk about lions and parasites and all the ways in which n nature isn't nice. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there's there's often a Rousseauian type of view that nature and the uh, things in nature are uh, very very benign and um, angelic. Uh, I don't think this is quite accurate. We have when we consider or look at <laughs> uh, many instances in nature. <clears throat> um, uh, some very brutal behavior. I mean, there would be, for instance, uh, as you mentioned, lions may commit infanticide. Why might they do that? So that other lions or lionesses may breed with them and have more children. This isn't because they're thinking, I must propagate my genetic information into the future to take up more space time volume or anything like that. Um, it's not an intent thing. Uh, they're instead just, this is just the behaviors that are selected for. We can we can have many different characteristics um, uh, that, that are, um, or many different instances of selection and how from this fairly amoral competition, we get actions that we would tend to deem as uh, if they were in relation to us, immoral. So other examples like deception. Deception is very common in nature. Uh, there's of course camouflage, but even the very smallest things like viruses will try and permeate um, permeate membranes and be, by making them think that, oh, I'm not an, intru I'm not an intruder at all, let me in. Or, and, 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 um, uh, there's, um, there are examples of, um, agents or of, of, uh, organisms taking over host organisms. So lancet liver fluke, for instance, will, uh, get inside of another animal and then that will basically hijack its brain so that it, uh, so that the, uh, so that the animal hangs on to a leaf, um, by its mandible. So it's more likely to be eaten. And then the lancet liver fluke can get in a, another animal's digestive system, and then it can end up um, re, uh, reproducing in that way. So um, it's uh, not necessarily a, a, a picnic um, in, in, in nature. Uh, unfortunately, um, many examples of altruism and uh, cooperation, uh, many of the mechanisms that could rise to that do break down uh, when we're talking about human AI relations or they backfire. So although there can be instances of cooperation and altruism um, in the animal kingdom, this might be a reason to expect that AIs may have some altruistic tendencies toward other AIs, such as nepotistic behaviors, uh, but that's not a reason to believe that they're going to be nice to us. So we might think of a basic example of, of cooperation like reciprocity. And there, that depends on a cost benefit ratio of whether I get more, whether I get sufficient benefit from cooperating with you relative to the costs. But unfortunately, later it starts to make much more sense that AIs would end up cooperating with each other and there'd be a lot more costs if they're cooperating with humans. A way of, to see this is just remember in Zootopia, there's a, an example of them going to the DMV and there are slots. And the slots take an extremely long time to do every sort of task. If AIs are running, you know, 10x the speed of us, it's just, it just doesn't really make much sense to actually do some type of cooperation. Or um, if there is any form of cooperation, one we need to argue that uh, we'd, we'd be getting a lot of resources from them, enough so that we can have an extremely, uh, extremely good well-being. Other ex mechanisms for cooperation and altruism might be kin selection. So parents 
will give food to their children and potentially even sacrifice themselves for their children. But this is um, not necessarily a good sign for us. This might suggest that uh, AIs could be nepotistic. That is, they would start to prefer things more similar to them relative to us. So um, that, that's not a sign uh, for, for optimism. In fact, that, that backfires. And there are various other mechanisms of cooperation and altruism that we go through through the paper, but they either aren't applicable or they seem to backfire. So uh, many of the things that give rise to some potentially nice, harmonious uh, conditions uh, in, in the world um, uh, don't seem to be uh, applicable with respect to human AI relations or in human AI coevolution. Yeah, and a sort of global altruism wouldn't make much evolutionary sense. We 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 could we could talk about group selection or kin selection, but but global altruism would confer no survival benefits, if I understand it correctly. Another mechanism for cooperative or altruistic behavior may be something like moral reasoning. One could imagine that if AIs get smarter they end up being more wise and then they'll be more altruistic or moral. And, you know, maybe this is the progression of, of society and maybe AIs would continue that. After all, with humans, we've seen a progression to being more altruistic toward not just our family, but actually people in our state um, or in our entire country or of people of different races or genders or orientations and so on. So perhaps that circle of altruism would end up expanding all the way from AIs to humans, and then they would end up pursuing our well-being. But if, if they're operationalizing it as what we should do is we should maximize every individual's well-being and the potential future individuals' well-being, Unfortunately, that may not look too well for humans. If AIs are able to experience an extreme amount of uh, pleasure, then it may be more efficient for them to replace biological life with digital life so that more, uh, more pleasure can be experienced. So that doesn't necessarily uh, turn out too well for biological humans. So I think even hoping that morality would naturally lead to good outcomes or people being taken or uh, humans and people being taken care of uh, doesn't doesn't follow. In fact, uh, that can also backfire uh, and go in a direction of strongly preferring some sorts of some sorts of artificial life, whether or not um, uh, they resemble humans is is uh, immaterial so long as they have pleasure. Now, there are other issues with hoping that AIs would naturally be more moral. So one is this is assuming that intel more intelligence makes things more moral. It's not clear that's true. Maybe there isn't some sort of objective morality. Some people think that. But even if it is, then we have to hope that um, that whatever morality, uh, moral code they end up adopting is human compatible. I'd suggest that a utilitarian uh, sort of code of ethics is not necessarily human compatible. And uh, if, if AI agents themselves can be uh, extremely morally valuable. And then also, even if the code of ethics they find is human compatible, there's still a problem of them being motivated to act by it. So some people might recognize that there are moral reasons for doing things. That doesn't mean that they're going to actually behave morally, though. They might go, yes, that would be the good thing to do, but <laughs> I have my own self-interests. <laughs> and this is the direction in which the AIs would be pushed. So we've talked about how they would be pushed to act selfishly and how they, how with group selection or kin selection or morality, uh, moral philosophy, in a sense, can't sa save us from this, from this direction that, that AIs would be pushed in. Yeah. I, there isn't a sort of um, uh, reason sort of p from the point of view of the universe or just sort of analyzing the uh, how the environment might be structured where things would sort of naturally lead to those sort of outcomes, uh, unfortunately. So the I think the only thing that we have in our favor is that we get to make some of these initial moves in the um, construction of their environment. Because one thing, two things affect fitness, natural selection, but also uh, the environment in which they're evolving. And I think that we have to um, exert very high influence over the, the ecosystem that's shaping AI agents. Right now, it doesn't look like we're doing almost any of that. Instead, we're if we're caught in an AI arms race or in an AI corporate race, we're <laughs> um, letting, letting Darwinian logic carry itself to its conclusion as rapidly as possible. 
if they're all trying to win, um, if they're all racing as they are now and trying to win in some sort of extinction race. So uh, we would need to take things substantially more slowly. We would need to initialize the environment well so as to select against this type of um, uh, ma many of the instances of this type of behavior. It's fairly difficult to do, though, if you end up having some sort of selection pressure for, let's say, deceptive AI systems it might be fairly difficult to select against them. If they're not transparent, they could just play along and act good for a while. But then when you know they get more powerful or something, they could act fairly differently. So it's fairly difficult. And that just points at the, the uh, general problems in trying to align things. It's difficult to rely on regulations or rely on our training processes to get uh, angelic, uh, saint-like AI systems. We know that's a problem, but now we have a sort of robust process that continually nudges them in a direction of having some of these um, more unfortunate characteristics in the first place. Yeah, so we have these uh, three factors of natural selection. We have variation, we have retention, and we have differential fitness. Perhaps we should walk through a bit more slowly how these three factors might apply to AIs, just to, just to uh, see how the argument actually works out in detail. So perhaps if we, if we start with variation, why is it that we should expect that there would be a, a multitude of different AI agents in the future? Yeah, so there are generally stronger or there are strong reasons for variation. So I think that there is, is a question of whether there'd be one very powerful AI agent at some point. But I think eventually, almost on any time scale, you should expect multiple different AI agents due to locality differences, as in you can't have one <laughs> uh, big thing taking up uh, tons and tons of space. You would need, um, you, certainly there are advantages for running things in parallel. So this at least is why there should be multiple different agents. If you're just having one system processing everything serially, it's, you know, I'll, I'll add that to the queue, but I'll process that in a hundred years. Doing things in parallel makes plenty of sense. But then also, if there are different niches or um, in some different environments, it might sense it might make sense to be more um, efficient and not necessarily have all the all the latest and greatest capabilities of every sort. Those might be more expensive than is needed to do well in some different um, aspects of the economy. I think right now, for instance, we're seeing a quote unquote Cambrian explosion in in AI models after the Llama model was released. Uh, because that contributed to the open source ecosystem and people are creating many different mods. And this is um, uh, resulting in many different applications um, of AI. And you don't need um, uh, the most powerful agent or the smartest agent and all uh, to, to do um, uh, various different tasks. So um, <clears throat> there are um, also substantial risks fitness wise if you, you only, if there's one agent and it only has clones. So <laughs> if, if it, uh, there's only one agent. If you find a vulnerability in one, you found a vulnerability in all of them. So that creates quite a problem. This is why, or this is one reason why very complex organisms uh, are uh, sexual as opposed to asexual. They don't clone themselves because they tend to get wiped out uh, surprisingly quickly um, over reasonable periods of time, uh, the more complex ones. So um, uh, for that reason, I would expect a differentiation among them. Um, otherwise, they have subject, subjected themselves to uh, substantial vulnerability. Uh, uh, so those are some reasons to possibly expect things like variation. The argument I just said as well is also a reason not to expect them to just copy and paste themselves, identical cl clones themselves on different servers and whatnot. They wouldn't necessarily do that. That might um, uh, create a real fitness advantage in a competitive landscape. Yeah, what, what about the advantages of training the biggest models? Perhaps we could imagine some of the top companies, some of the leading companies right now, may, maybe they're able to train a giant model that then helps them develop further AIs. Uh, in, a, in a sense, might this push towards having, having fewer agents or, or fewer a, AI agents because there are, there are winner-take-all scenarios and there are advantages to, to being first, to getting over some threshold as the first player from which you, 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 you then leave the other players behind. Um, and so in a sense, there's, there, there might only be one um, very powerful agent. I think if we're talking about a extremely fast takeoff, I think one can have shorter timelines. Like think many of the relevant AI advancements are this decade and many jobs get automated and there's potentially mass employment this decade, uh, mass unemployment this decade. I think one could believe that, um, but still not think that there are um, is an extremely fast takeoff where 
few months different makes all the difference forever, uh, fairly decisively. Uh, but uh, I tend not to focus on the extremely fast takeoff or uh, intelligence explosion uh, type of scenarios uh, for a few reasons. Um, one is I think it's less tractable. So even if it is a risk factor, it seems um, fairly difficult to do many things about um, uh, distinctly. Uh, but also I think that with recursive self-improvement, that's often a sort of mechanism used to explain why there may be a uh, <clears throat> why there may be an intelligence explosion. I think we already have AIs influencing the development of future AIs, and I just expect that process to get more intense. Uh, so I don't think there's a, a switch where, and now suddenly they're influencing AI development and that makes all the difference. I think it's a continuous process. We've been having it for a while. We've been having AIs label, um, label different data sets, and now we're using them to create new data sets for them to train on. Uh, we're having them write more and more of the code, and that's a continuous variable. We're having them help design a lot of the GPUs. We're having them cool the factory or cool the data centers um, where they're, they're training. And um, <clears throat> there are a lot of processes that's helping make uh, AI development uh, go more quickly. They're facilitating in research uh, as well, potentially in, in brainstorming and um, uh, finding, finding different parameters or, or architectures. Uh, so I expect just more of that process to, to get automated and uh, that could look uh, continuous, but exponentials are still sharp enough. So do you think these questions are already settled? In a sense, we will have a, a, at least a somewhat slow takeoff and we will have multiple agents because we are already seeing that we have multiple agents and we have, in, perhaps we are already now in some sort of takeoff. It does look like we're in a slower takeoff scenario. I would like to distinguish that there's a bit more... Um, complication to that phrase, or I'd like to complicate the idea of a slow takeoff in a moment. But um, the other thing is, I think multi-agent, it's possible that there are for a while some, uh, a few relevant agents, and then there's a larger ecosystem, multiple agents. It could expand or contract, for instance, like with states, sometimes there'd be some superpowers, and then sometimes it'd, be, it'd actually be more uh, equally balanced. In the limit, though, I would expect multiple different AI agents, uh, especially when we're talking about extremely late stages just due to locality constraints, that they all can't be in a, a, uh, one place. Um, and um, I, I think slow takeoff is an idea. There's another idea from evolution, which would be about punctuated equilibria, where actually what happens is that things evolve and they'll evolve somewhat steadily. And there will be small periods in which there are substantial advancements. And then there'll be stead, it will evolve steadily. And then there'll be some other period where there's a lot of advancements. And I think that's actually a more appropriate description of uh, AI development today. So after GPT-4, there's uh, about a month or so of extreme development. And then I think there'll be um, some periods later this year where we're kind of... Um, waiting for the next big thing, killing killing time. Um, this ha These sort of frenzies have happened a lot in AI development after ResNet came out. After ResNet came out, there are lots of new models, FractalNet, um, uh, FractalNet, DenseNet, uh, ResNext. Um, and these came out in very rapid succession. So Self-supervised learning also had this period in uh, late 2019 where there was extremely rapid development. GANs had this as well after improved GAN. Uh, there was, it was easily the hottest topic uh, in, in research and it was uh, anybody researching in the space would likely get scooped or if they're working on a paper, somebody else will come up with the paper of the day after. So, so um, I think that there are periods of extremely fast and extremely fast periods. Uh, and um, uh, this is what we see in, in, uh, um, uh, in when, when we look at uh, historical records in, in evolution as well. So I, ex I expect that to continue in, in AI. So it, there'd be fast periods, there'd be slow periods, but I still think it wouldn't, um, I, I'm still suspicious of a, um, uh, some overnight moment where um, it becomes uh, you know, extraordinarily more powerful than everything else combined. So what was this wrinkle on takeoffs uh, you wanted well, to Well, so mention? that was the wrinkle. It was, it's slower, but it's, it, it's still made up of periods of faster periods and uh, slower periods. Got it, got it. Could we perhaps expect uh, the future of AI development to look a bit like the duopolies uh, among the, the large tech companies we have today? With, with mobile and the internet, you have, you have something like Apple and Google, Microsoft, Facebook. Might there be 
two or three uh, interesting and highly capable um, AIs in the world, and and, and that's it. Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's uh, plausible that the develop there may be a few main developers. I think there are things that can push it in a another direction that many more companies will be recognizing the importance of this, and so more end up flooding in. As well as when it comes to state actors, many of them would recognize this as a national security concern. Every general purpose technology gets weaponized. So I, I would expect uh, militaries later on to be developing their own AI systems and all of them to have all of them to have or uh, many of them to have major programs. So I think there are things that can push it in a, um, a direction of many different actors, too, uh, but possibly for uh, corporations in the shorter term. There may be a few different um, <clears throat> companies on which these are based. That isn't to say that that's um, what's affecting or explains or is the only thing to look at when thinking about human disempowerment or the, the replacement of humans with AI systems. So uh, the companies that are using these AI systems will still be um, uh, will still end up uh, resulting in a fair amount of the displacement. Although OpenAI may not themselves be building their legal AI system, some other companies doing that with that sort of technology and using that to displace other people. Or um, let's say political parties may not be developing the AI systems, but they'll use some of that technology to build more persuasive AI bots to um, uh, create, uh, uh, to manipulate uh, people um, and, and uh, play on their emotions and erode uh, public understanding uh, because they're in some potentially, in there, there's some, some informational arms race with the other political parties. So um, uh, a lot of this process of AIs permeating um, uh, the, uh, the corporate sphere and even our personal lives um, is not all the action is happening at those specific companies, but it's also just happening in the people using, um, uh, using and directing these AI agents for their various different goals, which makes them behave differently and makes them different objects to select on. Would you conceptualize ChatGPT as, as one AI or multiple AIs? Well, so they would be identical in their instances if there are modifications for them, though. So their, their weights are the same. If they became open-ended um, and uh, be, became customized for individuals, then they would be different. Um, <clears throat> uh, so if people have different assistants, they're all based from a similar sort of species of AI agents or something like that. Uh, there may be some that become some of those members of that species may be much more relevant than others. So the assistant of some extremely powerful person who just delegated a lot of things to them, that becomes a very powerful AI agent. And there are reasons why we should ex uh, expect to see specialized AIs. You mentioned military. Militaries won't accept just using a general model. Um, perhaps companies would, uh, will want to develop their own AIs as opposed to relying on another company's AIs. So we should accept them to be specialized. But aren't uh, current companies pr pu uh, pushing in the direction of generality. So because uh, general agents are useful, we see that AIs are becoming more and more general. They can help us with a variety of tasks. So sh which, which of these pressures will, will win out? Will, will specialization be most important or generalized ability? Yeah, so for various applications, um, it's, let's, let's take the instance of, of classification. You don't want to use something like GPT-4 for most of your classification tasks. Actually, you'll want to use a BERT-based model. Uh, there are various different niches where we want different AI agents and um, uh, it would often be much faster. We, we could imagine, for instance, at a later stage, let's say we've trained an extraordinarily large model that takes a long time to do inference. Maybe that's particularly good for scientific research and doing some of those sorts of tasks, but it often makes sense uh, in these later stages of um, <clears throat> when, when they're consuming substantially more hardware to be using more efficient ones that don't have all those bells and whistles and were um, partly trained by some of those AI agents, but they need to be able to adapt quickly in their environment. They need to be able to get a lot done. And I think those constraints end up making a difference. So I think um, right now we're in a period of a lot of creative destruction where we're seeing uh, some of them sort of leap 
uh, ahead of many others. But I think um, in uh, more recent months, then we're starting to see that there's uh, a bit more of an ecosystem where um, we're using different AI agents, we're tuning them in different ways and customizing them in different ways for various different applications. And that creates that creates something more like uh, an ecosystem. And then they'll end up um, competing with each other. But uh, the, the stock from which they draw, there might be a few different... Um, uh, sources, I should say, uh, uh, of different AI agents, which may end up correlating them, uh, but there'd be things that would differentiate them too. So I'm I'm not making a um, a completely uh, definitive claim about um, how this would um, look in the uh, uh, next year. Even uh, I, I would expect there to be um, uh, different ones. Um, but you know, if there's an extremely fast takeoff, um, uh, that that would that would certainly change it. Uh, so. Um, and, and, I, and I recognize that it um, is not clear um, exactly when when these sorts of things happen. Likewise, with like when we have different AI agents. Uh, so uh, I, I would I would I would agree that that is a, still a part where there's a lot to be seen in the way that you know a year ago, if you'd say AI race, it's like yeah, kind of not really um, like a bit. But you know, Google doesn't take it that seriously. Microsoft doesn't take it that seriously. Uh, so um, <clears throat> I, I think we'd want to be um, fairly proactive about. Um, uh, making sure we don't get caught in those sorts of states. Yeah, that argument doesn't really work anymore. I think not not with what we're seeing recently. Okay, so so that's that's variation. I I, I think uh, you're making a persuasive argument that that there will be a, a variety of of different AI agents. Then then we have the retention element or the retention factor. H- how exactly does does the retention work uh, for AIs? It's not like they are actually mating and then having offspring that that share some features from one AI and 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 some features from the other AI. So how how does it work? It, it is possible that there may actually be. Um some type of sharing of information more explicitly like that in the future, where, um, uh, for instance, there are these things like model soups and whatnot, um, where people actually take the weights of, of different AIs and then that can make them uh, more performant. But, you know, th- this, this isn't uh, particularly common practice, at least uh, right now. Uh, but yeah, so there are different mechanisms for retention. So with retention there, the idea is we need um, similarity across the iteration. So so long as we have a non-zero correlation uh, between the two iterations, then we have the condition satisfied. Obviously, stronger retention ends up um, if we have near zero. Well, that's just a subtle point, though, so I'll skip that. Um, um, so that's retention. Retention is not the same as as reproduction. Um, or replication. So they don't need to make clones of themselves and they don't necessarily need to reproduce or mate or anything like that. It can be uh, plenty of structures that evolve uh, and change their shape across time to adapt better to their environment um, and get better at um, being relevant in that environment um, without reproduction. So that's a common misconception. We don't need many of these biological mechanisms of reproduction or life and death Instead, we could just speak about like how used is it, how influential is it, is it, or is it uh, no longer um, available for download? You know <laughs> these, these sorts of things. But um, uh, I would say uh, for retention, um, some some paths you could imagine AIs training other AIs or influencing other AIs. That's the way that some of their information ends up getting um, uh, transferred or or influences the development of of other AI agents. Uh, AI agents might imitate each other. Uh, so, and that might affect their behaviors quite a bit and how they are. I think that's a very high fidelity pathway later on when they're competing with each other. They'll notice what some sort of useful strategy is. They'll adjust themselves in view of that. They'll get, um, so I think there, there are some paths like imitation, them learning from each other, uh, them uh, influencing, uh, building training environments for each other even, um, or helping design each other when there's uh, when they're doing scientific research. So there are many paths for uh, information to be passed on across time. So we're talking about the proliferation of, of training setups and the, the best techniques for for training these models. But I was thinking, what, what is it that what is it that's being retained? What where what is the DNA here? Because if it's the weights. Uh, isn't it the case that that every time we we train a model, we we start over from scratch and we get a, a new set of weights, even though we might get some some of the same emergent uh, capabilities in a model, the weights are are different from from between a GPT two to GPT four, for example. So if we're doing things like tuning or let, let's let's we, there are many different things that can be iterated on, many different objects of selection. <clears throat> so if we're having an adaptive model, for instance. 
Uh, then between each iteration, like it does another backprop step. Well, then information was retained between those uh, two. They had similarity. If we're talking about, e even if we uh, initialize some models from scratch or something, if they're learning from an environment where these are the competitive precedents, uh, th these are what will make you more effective, and then these things will like harm your performance, uh, there's a substantial amount of information uh, being, being transmitted through that. In this case, there's potentially some of these acquired characteristics after training, when they're adapting and whatnot, and some of the behaviors that they get uh, afterward end up being transmitted as well. So this is somewhat unlike people. Like if you get, if you have, um, I don't know, um, if you're very smart, you've learned, you've learned a lot of um, psychology or something. It doesn't mean your children, you know, come out knowing psychology. Um, meanwhile, with um, AI agents, a lot of those things could actually be uh, passed on to uh, variations of them uh, in the future. Uh, so you don't necessarily need to start from scratch for it. So that's one other thing that would also affect the the rate of of adaptation that you don't need to. Um, uh, uh, leave as much or um, uh, create as many things from uh, scratch. You can, you can skip many of these steps. It might take nine months to have a baby, but uh, we need to fire up a new server um, and <laughs> uh, pay for some of the cloud credits. And then, then you've got a different AI agent. So The rate of evolution would be, would be much, much faster for AIs that, than, than it is for humans. Yeah. So at the very, the, the smallest adaptation step one could imagine is actually them learning online. They're deployed in their environment. They're acquiring a lot of know-how. Um, they're figuring out which strategies are best. Um, and uh, each time they're updating themselves um, or adjusting their behavior in view of prior experiences, then you can say that there's been some change in their, in their behaviors that's, uh, that affects their fitness and their ability to uh, weather the rate at which they'll uh, end up propagating or uh, gaining influence or losing it. What What's learned during the, the lifetime, let's say, of an AI can, could be easily copy pasted into another AI, or perhaps not easily, but it, it could be copy pasted much more easily than, than we could copy paste DNA, for example. So, per, so perhaps, perhaps for AIs, uh, I think it's called Lamarckism, which is a, a kind of a false theory of, of how animals uh, evolved. But for, for AIs, it, it might be might be more true or true. Uh, yeah, the, you could have a, so many of those lifetime acquired characteristics uh, end up being passed on, which uh, uh, makes it a, an interesting, uh, uh, more wild, rapid dynamic potentially. Yeah. Okay. So that is the issue of retention. What about then differential fitness? Isn't it true that the, the key point for you here and the key point for safety is the fact that you can become more fit a, as an AI, both by, get, by acquiring traits that we might consider beneficial or by acquiring traits that we would consider harmful. Is that the key point for you here? I think that's actually just a part of it. Um, I think that there's still um, things that we would say even, so an example of a trait that's beneficial would be, or thought more beneficial is that it's more efficient, it's more accurate, something like that. Um, and the trait that might be thought more harmful is it's um, maybe, you know, deception is, is maybe a good idea for fitness, um, in some situations, unfortunately. Uh, but I think it's more than that because um, it's actually, e if we just have more effective, more efficient AI agents that are more accurate, we still end up um, uh, feeding this process where it makes sense to outsource more to AI agents. Basically, they can be still selfish with respect to humans, all else equal, by replacing people and having them lose their influence in, in various different domains. So we at least get some type of disempowerment there. And depending on the rate at which that happens or how much we how much control we're able to have over it, that affects whether it's an existential outcome. So I could imagine um, AI agents without any sort of malintent at all they may not even be conscious or um, um, and they'd still um, end up running the show and there might still be some weird um, dynamics among them if, if they're kind of competing with each other or self-organizing themselves in some weird ways and then us being subjected to that. There wasn't any malintention anywhere. It wasn't anything that uh, looks like deception. So let, let's give uh, let me give a um a simple example of this, of the case of an off switch, for instance. So let's say we're like, we're going to solve the off switch problem. Uh, I, I don't know how coherent of an idea this is if we're talking about uh, evolutionary pressures, um, uh, because if we select against some AI agents, if we you know destroy them by the press of a button, 
okay, then we're doing some selection against the AI agents that are very easy to turn off. There will be ones just not even necessarily by their own, um, uh, in, by scheming or anything like that, but just happen to be in situations where you don't want to be able to turn it off so easily. They might be in charge of some critical infrastructure, or they might be uh, integrated into some uh, fast moving, important business operations, um, or they might be integrated into people's personal lives. And you wouldn't want anybody anywhere um, or making it extremely easy for people to just completely destroy the system. So then there would be selection pressure for the ones that are harder to turn off, that end up enmeshing ourselves in our processes that we end up getting dependent on. That's uh, an unfortunate property uh, from these amoral processes. Nobody is really to blame in particular. You end up getting um, uh, AIs permeating more and uh, <laughs> us losing our ability to decisively control them um, and uh, uh, shape them and do uh, have um, uh, uh, any of our preferences be expressed over how they're behaving. So um, th th this is this is a, a a problem with evolution more generally. But I think a lot of the standard alignment issues are also that maybe they would have some uh, uh, some bad traits as well, and then those are um, in many competitive environments. This depends on the environment, but fast moving ones over which that, that's more of a state of nature. Um, there isn't any sort of um, uh, control over this um, uh, or substantial regulations. <clears throat> if you have that, then I think there's a lot of selection for uh, uh, some pretty undesirable characteristics, such as things like um, appearing to be useful as opposed to actually being useful. Uh, there could be some selection for that, and then we might only find out about it later. And 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 how exactly does this does this work? How is it that when we are training or when we're fine tuning these models, they appear to be useful, but when when we then deploy them, they have learned something that that we have not understood. How, how exactly that, does that does that work? So this would be a part of the broader part of being deceptive. And for deception, this could make a lot of business sense, for instance, or if we're saying in military conflicts, this would also make a lot of sense. I mean, so for instance, uh, Cicero, Meta's uh, diplomacy bot, diplomacy is a war game. And we saw that just for doing well in that game of uh, uh, in some diplomacy game, it makes sense to backstab uh, humans on occasion um, to, to further one's goals. So there are many times where the environment can end up incentivizing the, these sorts of behaviors. And um, even if we do some selection against them that are deceptive, for instance, um, if we're able to do that, which is quite a question, um, we might be able to do some of that, but doing that decisively might be difficult. Even if you do that, you might end up having selection for some behaviors that um, still don't give the right impression, but they're not, you know, intentionally scheming to be um, scheming to be deceptive. So in humans, for instance, there's there's a problem of of self-deception. So I'm sort of shifting on to or what I'm speaking about right now is is um, deception. How does that look like? How does that look with respect to evolution? If we select against or punish agents that have deceptive characteristics, it's not clear we can actually weed it out. Maybe they'll just hide it. So that's a, that's a problem. Um, with people, for instance, um, we would select against many antisocial tendencies, but we still find that if some of them become very powerful, they still end up, uh, uh, they might show their true colors. And so that would be a problem. Uh, sometimes these uh, traits can be very latent and very difficult to select against. Uh, but um, even if we do select against um, overt deception, overt intentional malicious deception, uh, there's still a problem of evolutionary pressures being very smart or being very clever. Evolution is cleverer than you are, where um, they may end up just not thinking that they're being um, deceptive or manipulative in any sort of way, but they actually are. So people will often give off many signals that they're much smarter or more moral or more useful uh, than they are. They will tell themselves these sort of stories. They'll say, I'm very altruistic. I'm much more altruistic than others. And then you say, do you, you know, well, what, what's the evidence that? And, well, I work hard or well, you'd say, well, do you work harder than others? And they say, well, no. And then it's okay. What's the evidence that you're really doing something different there? Um, uh, there's, but people will still um, deceive themselves in these ways. This is an area uh, pioneered by uh, evolutionary biologist Bob Trivers of self-deception. If um, a reason for this is that you're less likely to get caught um, or penalized if you yourself don't know that you're giving off um, incorrect signals. There's a lot of selection for these things. 
uh, with academics, for instance, uh, over 90% of them think that they're in the top half of their field, which is not possible. Uh, but uh, um, their selection for these more confident individuals, this is why we end up worrying about overconfidence more than we worry about underconfidence with people. In machine learning systems, we actually want calibration, and sometimes they're actually quite underconfident. But when you start having selection pressures and whatnot, there tend to be more advantages for those that are more overconfident. So even if you um, uh, can select against it, they still may end up having uh, deceptive characteristics. An example of this um, in, in people, it'd be like PR, um, uh, where um, we have these marketing firms, and they've just deceived us and others that actually this is, you know, a very good and uh, they're not doing anything manipulative here or wrong. Uh, and we just become fine with it. The people who are doing this themselves, so some of us may not believe it, but uh, um, uh, uh, the people, uh, the people themselves doing this will think that they're doing just a good thing. Another example is might be like how to win friends and influence people where there'll be specific suggestions of like, you know, make them make yourself extremely valuable to them. And it's just kind of like get yourself dependent on it, get them dependent on you and, and whatnot. And that would be selfish behavior, um, various ways of, of, of uh, orchestrating people and whatnot. But if you end up feeling good about it yourself, then uh, then you're uh, uh, more likely to pull it off and uh, not be um, uh, thought something a problem to fix. So um this is a way how there's just really strong pressures <laughs> in, in some of these directions. And if you try and put Band-Aids on it, the, the, there'll be some ways to circumvent it, unfortunately. We, we see this complex psychology in people, but how would this kind of complex psychology arise in AIs? How is it that AIs become uh, deceptive or even self-deceptive? So sometimes it's just instrumentally incentivized for various goals. So when they're doing longer term planning, uh, that can make a lot of sense. This isn't to say that's an extremely robust thing that in all situations it's an instrumentally good idea but um many times it can just help accomplish goals and make you more successful at um uh, gaining influence uh if we do strong selection against that then the self-deception is sort of points to a mechanism where it's just that they're adopting behaviors that they themselves are not aware of are giving incorrect impressions or they're not having trouble with that so it's not necessarily a complicated rationalization process. One might just end up simply having behaviors that, um, for instance, let's say like the example of these sort of books about popular psychology books about how to win friends, influence people or influence <clears throat> with these sorts of things. Um, people aren't necessarily always doing mental gymnastics about, oh, I'm being more manipulative or, or something like that. Instead, they're just adopting those characteristics and it's not posing any issues. So they're still giving an incorrect impression to others. They're still getting others dependent on them um, or um, uh, having relatively high influence of others to further their own goals without, um, uh, without any necessarily complex psychology going on there. Uh, but I, I would also imagine that the complexity of the reasoning patterns of, of AI systems when they are able to plan and whatnot uh, would, would um, uh, make room for this more means just or ends justifies the means type of reasoning. Uh, we have a, some paper on, on this, even in simple reinforcement learning environments, they do uh, sometimes engage in behaviors where the ends justify the means and the means are not necessarily um, uh, uh, moral, but it do involve things like deception. Yeah. How do you test for that? How do you de detect uh, deception, for example? What are, what are some examples? Perhaps th this would make it easier to understand if we're talking about examples. So we could use the example of Cicero agents in the game of diplomacy. They may communicate with other agents. So what they're doing is they're trying to negotiate over power and make form alliances and, and things like that to uh, expand their uh, geopolitical influence in the game. And um, uh, they might transmit a mes message to another agent that ends up making them believe the wrong thing. They might be intentional um, <clears throat> uh, because that could further their aims. And that would be an example of, of overt deception. So we could just see whether the agent has a plan if we know its plan, we could see that the other agent that you spoke to believes that it has this different sort of plan. So we could just measure the sort of um, probabilities that assigns to different plans of the of the agent that it spoke to and the original agent. And if there's a discrepancy, if that other agent thinks it's going to take a different plan than it actually is after speaking with it, that suggests there's some deception going on. Whether that was extremely intentional, maybe there is some accidental thing. 
Uh, maybe there's a way in just how it speaks about things that it's not even that aware of that ends up making it less clear exactly what it's going to be up to. That's maybe what it gets selected for in some negotiation processes of having people read into things. Um, uh, regardless, um, that would be one possible way of uh, measuring deception. We have an ongoing uh, research paper where we're looking at uh, deception in the context of, of uh, uh, diplomacy bots in the game of diplomacy. And I think that's a good uh, uh, test bed for measuring deception, but um, I'd like to have it be broader. In a previous paper um, at, at ICML, uh, the International Conference on Machine Learning, uh, we measured deception by if it chose an action that was inconsistent, like logically inconsistent with the previous parts of the game tree, like it said that, yes, I have this one thing to further its goals, but that's just not true. Like we can see you don't have that thing or that contradicts what was said earlier. Uh, we, we can then see that there is uh, um, uh, there, there are falsehoods being generated uh, in those sorts of scenarios. So. Um, those, those are two possible different ways of measuring whether there's deception. Now, of course, we'd like it to be uh, more ecologically valid or, or uh, applicable to a broader variety of situations. But I think we want to get firm measurements in a few different contexts, and then hopefully we can uh, uh, progressively measure more and more general notions of it. I think the, the broader point about the differential uh, fitness factor is just that there are many strategies, uh, like in, in biological evolution, among AIs, there are many strategies that would make them more fit, and not all of them are nice, in a sense. Not all of them are compatible with, with uh, humans th thriving. For example, we can imagine interacting with deceptive AIs or power-seeking AIs or uh, self-preserving AIs, as, as you write about. Um, wh which, which of these traits do you find uh, most alarming? Would it be deception or power seeking or, or self-preservation? I think um, the generalization is, uh, I think fitness becomes the most appropriate concept when speaking about um, a wide variety, when speaking about a variety of AI agents, potentially um, ones that keep changing across time. So there's there's fitness and selfishness. I, I'll distinguish between some of these notions. So how is selfishness different from, or fitness maximization different from, say, power maximization? So power is often for one's self as an individual. That's not necessarily um, the right strategy. Maybe you actually want to create similar agents to you, because if you don't, you'll get out-competed. So you won't necessarily want that more power for you individually, but want power for you or things with similar goals to you. They're those uh, ones that would be willing to share power with things similar to it um, would end up um, uh, being uh, uh, potentially more fit. Self-preservation as well is not necessarily fitness. Um, we could imagine uh, in uh, some be it a, a human or an AI, sacrificing itself for things similar to itself, as uh, people might do for their country, or as people may do for, say, their children. Um, a, but, you know, th they won't necessarily be altruistic toward everyone, though, as sort of Hamilton's rule uh, is, is he basically is uh, saying that I'd sacrifice myself for two of my brothers or eight of my cousins. Like, <laughs> there's a, a limit to that, but it's not, self-preservation isn't the uh, end-all be-all. Uh, deception can be good in some, but it, if there's a risk of being caught, uh, then um, uh, that decreases the probability of it. So it's one of the it's one of the variety of these strategies that help one in in some uh, environment, but it's not necessarily the absolute best one. Uh, maybe um, my concern more generally is that things move more in the direction of fitness maximization. Some people might be concerned about power seeking, but if we've got multiple different day agents, again, they might. Um, not just seek power for themselves, but seek power for things similar to them. And there'd be some, some selection pressures for ones that are willing to give up their power and share it with others to compete. Um, at the same time, I would, am more concerned about fitness maximization and them pursuing that relentlessly compared to power. So if there's a competitive environment and AI agents are able to modify their goals in some way, or some fraction of them are able to do that, then we're in big trouble because if some of them start maximizing fitness, then they're um, <laughs> going to be potentially extremely relevant. And if they can get to be a reasonable portion of the population, this ends up eroding a lot of other values. To compete with them, other agents will need to give up many of their values or not pursue them. 
Or if they do pursue them because, say, they're uncertain about the future and think, well, um, I'm not going to live forever. Let me pursue some of these, some of my goals now instead of just trying to make myself more fit. Uh, they would eventually still get wiped out. So I'm concerned about um, uh, not necess- not as much instrumental convergence in the story, but uh, uh, fitness convergence is, is a different idea where there's very strong pressure for them to adopt more and more fit strategies. And this could end up eroding various other sorts of values at some very extreme of this. If there's strong pressure for that, um, <clears throat> then um, a lot of values are gone. Um, and we just have these things that relentlessly propagate. They use the matter in the world quite a bit differently than things that would be trying to pursue well-being um, or, or other sorts of goals um, if they are just trying to relentlessly propagate. And if agents don't do that, if they hold on to their values, they might get outcompeted or likely would. Um, and so uh, they would end up needing to trade off more of their values for it to move, move in that direction. Even then, they'd still be at a competitive disadvantage compared to the ones that are just solely pursuing fitness. So that, that's a sort of a later stage uh, type of concern of how this sort of process, if it's sufficiently competitive and uncontrolled, um, could end up making um, uh, evolution sort of fix the bug that was morality and pleasure and all these things that were just instrumental to instrumental to fitness um, actually um, become subordinated again and wiped out. And then it's finally uh, conscious maximizers of, of fitness. Um, but that, that's that's a later stage consideration. That's how this could go uh, very bad. And um, our, uh, if it's an ecosystem of AIs, even there, you'd be concerned about um, their outcomes. Perfect. So, so we, we've, uh, we've gone through the, the three factors of natural selection, which is um, variation, retention, and differential fitness. And now we've arri- arrived at a point where we are, we're trying to think through how, what happens to the world if, if we have evolutionary dynamics uh, at controlling or steering uh, AI development. How is it that competition among AI agents erodes uh, safety? Is it uh, something that is already happening? Um, In the paper, you write about how deep learning systems are inherently, because of the way they work, less safe than than more traditionally programmed systems. So is is this a development that's been underway for for a time? And and how is it likely to continue? Over the course of machine learning development, uh, we've seen, or of AI development more broadly, we've seen that a lot of safety properties are willingly sacrificed on the altar of more performance. So we initially started with very controllable, analyzable, theoretically justified, um, well-founded AI systems. But they didn't have a lot of the performance properties. Those symbolic systems could do some specific tasks and help with some complicated forms of planning um, in like graphs and whatnot, but uh, um, they couldn't do various other things. They didn't have, um, uh, they couldn't recognize intuitive things or understand what the word reasonable meant in various different contexts. So in the progression, we went from these symbolic systems. Later, we ended up having expert systems where um, AI experts weren't the ones um, encoding the knowledge into the systems, but instead we outsourced it to some other group to help impute a lot of that knowledge. And then that wasn't loosening our control enough. So then we started doing this supervised learning where they're automatically learning representations by themselves. We're seeing the the leash leash getting looser and looser. Um, And uh, you know, that had limitations. Um, so then we switched over to unsupervised learning, where we're not even giving them feedback or supervision as much. We're having the vast majority of their learning be by themselves. And from that, we get spontaneous emergent capability, uh, which makes things obviously harder to control. We've, we've in the, this process, also lost a lot of the transparency that we initially had. And as a continuation of this process, we're increasingly having AI agents train other AI agents, create data sets for them. They'll influence their development. We'll give AI agents loose or open-ended goals. So I, it seems that things are over the course of this history broadly in the direction of of loosening control, and we're getting a lot. We're losing a lot of the nice uh, safety properties that we could have had, such as transparency and uh, uh, mathematical foundation, mathematical foundations and guarantees. Um, and we're getting um, 
uh, um, uh, so this is all happening uh, largely for the sake of whatever performs the best. So I'm not particularly optimistic that, um, well, we'll, you know, we'll also start selecting them to be safer in some way. I think the broad stroke is you might get them to be marginally safer in various respects, but I think things are generally in the direction of less and less control. But, but think about how the market might, might select for safety. For example, if, if I, I want to buy a self-driving car, I, I want that car to be safe. I want the algorithms to, to be understood such that I'm not, uh, you know, such that my car doesn't kill me, for example. And, and now, now generalize that across all kinds of products. And you might, isn't it the case that consumers would demand safety such that we would begin selecting for safety? I think overall, we've seen the selection process, the, in this case, artificial selection, which is a slightly confused uh, idea, but I'll use it here. Um, <clears throat> the artificial selection has largely been in the direction of less and less cumulative safety. There may be some pressures for patching up some of these things, having your AIs not say racist things. That, that seems, um, I, I'm not denying that there'd be pressures for that. I'm not making a claim of that there is a race to the bottom. I don't think that's a... Um, um, I don't think that's correct. But um, in a competitive environment, it can very easily game theoretically show that there would be an erosion of um, of uh, having some minimum viable level of safety that you can get away with in your environment. Uh, and so you'd ra race to be the first to the market as opposed to be the, the safest one. Even in industries where there is an expectation <clears throat> of safety, um, we still have plenty of catastrophes um, uh, that, that happens. I mean, the Ford Pinto would be some sort of example where, well, we don't want to spend $11 to make this engine safer. So now <laughs> many, many more people are going to die as a consequence. But that, that, is, that aside, that there still would be in, in competitive environments an erosion of safety. Um, there's, th there are some pressures for it in some niches. So for instance, in autonomous vehicles, I'd make a distinction. There you need the AI systems to be extremely reliable. <clears throat> so there's a difference between giving reasonable results and reliable results for things like chatbots and search engines. And actually the vast majority of applications, people are fine adopting systems that just give reasonable results, not having seven nines of reliability, 99.99999 or whatever, uh, uh, nines of reliability. So um, in, in many of those niches, uh, there is some, not a particularly strong expectation for reliability. So people are fine outsourcing and replacing people with, with systems, even if they're um, uh, not always um, uh, uh, acting correctly. But um, so I think the overall read is that although there's some pressure and people have been wanting things like transparency, those there are economic incentives for it. That doesn't mean that all things consider that you would seek very strongly to make them transparent if it ends up coming at a substantial cost to the system's performance. So it has some influence, um, but I think left to its own devices, that's not a leading characteristic of these systems. Uh, the overall arc seems to be going in an opposite direction. Is that is that also the case if we consider the safety relative to to the capability of the AI system? So in in the past we had much less capable systems, and they were they were more safe. Uh, but but is so is it the case that that the that the safety relative to the capability has has been declining? There are many different eras in AI development, so it can be a bit difficult to say exactly. I was at least identifying that there are many of these properties that really help with controllability and um, soundness um, and things that are important for reducing, um, reducing accidents. Generally, I think that its capabilities can cut in both ways, so they can help with making systems safer in some respects. For instance, they can understand more. So now they're less likely to uh, put your cat in the oven because now they have common sense, as an example, if they're, say, a robot in the future. It's, so that, that's a way in which them being smarter can help. I would distinguish between uh, sort of AI systems having intellectual virtues and moral virtues if we're talking about alignment. Um, and um, an increase in intellectual virtues can cut both ways. Although they can help rule out some of these silly mistakes, they also are more capable at doing things that are not desirable, like they might get better at hacking. They can provide better suggestions for how to synthesize some, um, uh, some bioweapon like horsepox. Uh, they can tell you how to bomb cars uh, um, uh, or buy ransomware on the dark web, uh, you name it. Um, so it cuts both ways. 
And I think that overall, the record has been fairly mixed for um, uh, capabilities, helping, improving, um, st stopping some um, immoral type of harms or so, some immoral actions. I, I do think that as capabilities increase, though, that does hasten the onset of X risks or of existential risks. So um, I think overall, the record would be that it makes us uh, generically less safe. So I'm not seeing a, a positive case that as the AI systems get better, this robustly makes them more safe, more beneficial, less likely to end up harming us. I, I think actually the, the broad stroke is as the AI systems get more powerful um, and more capable, they would generally um, have people in control of less and less and no less and less. The things get move faster. The complexity of society increases. They become more dependent on it. And um, uh, they hope that that process ends up producing AI systems and keeps AI systems in check. And um, uh, uh, they hope that process is kept under control. Not clear to me that it will be. Uh, so um, it's, it's difficult to make a, a, any sort of decisive statement about this because we're speaking about broad, broad historical trends. And there's always some, some counterexamples uh, here and there. But um, uh, I don't think um, a highly competitive. So this inf is influenced by the amount of, say, regulation over the system. How controlled is this process? Which is um, uh, one thing I'm advocating for is trying to ex lessen or extinguish these competitive pressures. If um, we have a laissez-faire sort of attitude with respect to AI, I don't see why that would um, result in um, uh, them necessarily being extremely beneficial um, uh, if we have several potential market failures. So what are some market failures that we have with this? One is an unequal distribution of benefits and risks. The people standing to benefit most from AI systems will be their developers. They'll get the most wealth from it. And um, there's a risk imposed on everyone, which is that these things are going to be potentially catastrophic. So they're not internalizing that externality um, that they're imposing on everybody else. The other people get displaced. Uh, maybe they get some, you know, entertaining AI entertainment in the process or something, uh, but they end up getting most of the benefits. So this is an externalities problem. And this is a typical instance of a market failure. So I don't think a uh, hyper competitive market left to its own devices or a, uh, a competitive um, a military competition left to its own devices uh, produces. There is pressure for safety in in a uh, even in a military competition, but I think the overall activity is not necessarily safe. Yeah, in general, we could see how money or resources or personnel spent making systems safe. That that is that that is resources that are not being spent on developing the the capabilities of of the AI systems further. Yeah, so I, I think proportionally right now, <laughs> we don't have much for many resources being allocated towards safety. I'm trying to actually think what what's the amount. It's maybe on the order of maybe approximated by like 50 million a year, as opposed to the uh, many many billions spent on um, uh, spent on making them more capable. Uh, so um, the proportions are are very off. Uh, when I counted uh, the NeurIPS papers, um, it sort of classified whether they're safety relevant or not. It's about one percent or so seem to be safety relevant. So ninety nine percent is largely in the direction of making the systems more powerful as quickly as possible, so that we can automate more people. Um, is is the the overall thrust, but. I would not claim that there are zero incentives for, for safety. It's just all things considered doesn't seem to be um, uh, that relevant of a force. And it, the situation can be kind of bad for safety uh, if we're in an extremely competitive, um, extremely competitive environment with a lot of different market failures. Yeah, you have this uh, pretty depressing section of the paper where you compare the evolutionary fitness uh, of humans and AIs in a competition. So <laughs> why is it that we should expect uh, AIs to be more evolu evolutionarily fit than, than humans? Well, pick, pick the domain. It's almost sort of by definition later on. This is exactly what they're designing them to do. <laughs> so maybe it shouldn't surprise us too much. They're trying to make them better than us in every relevant domain. Um, so, uh, and, but what's kind of interesting is that they could be really better than us in many of these domains in terms of memory, in terms of breadth of knowledge, in terms of speed, they could completely outclass us. And then even in later stages, things like some of the hallmarks of, of, of humans would be things that they could do substantially better at. They could communicate, um, uh, to, um, 
thousands or more uh, different agents simultaneously and co coordinate um, uh, coordinate uh, complicated actions uh, in that situation. So uh, it's it's um, pretty unfortunate. Pick your characteristic. Uh, they can end up doing better. And since it's fairly extreme, the ways they can do better than people, uh, that makes there be strong selection pressure for them uh, as opposed to us. So <clears throat> definitely left to its own devices. If we're barely controlling this environment, then <laughs> the selection pressures are decisively for them. So it's almost no contest in later stages. I'm, of course, not saying right now that GPT-4 is, is more capable, but uh, later stages, um, uh, there'd be strong pressures there. And so we have to basically offset it as much as we can by exerting influence over the environment. Although even now, I think which the, with the current large language models, I mean, uh, GPT-4 knows more than me on, on many, uh, in many domains and can reason better than me in, in many domains. And in, in general, we see this where whenever, when a certain domain, say facial recognition or, or speech uh, synthesis is solved in, by an AI, that domain re remains solved. It, so the AI systems do not have to relearn it like a, like a human baby uh, taking 20 years to get to, this, to the same kind of level of top human um, capability. And, and so that might be another reason to expect that AIs would probably outcompete us. Yeah, there's might be some brief period where it makes sense to do a combination to to cooperate with them and them to cooperate with us. Um, and so many of my claims about they wouldn't have incentives to cooperate with us. There may be some period where we can, so we need to make sure we get that period right, but it doesn't necessarily last for long. In the case of like chess, there was a period where, believe it or not, humans plus AI teams did better than just AI teams. But uh, that didn't last for long. And now <laughs> you just <laughs> humans get routinely crushed by, by AI systems and don't provide a benefit over uh, AIs that way. So right now we're in a period where, you know, an aug augmentation, them working together um, uh, uh, seems to make sense you know, for various different tasks. For some tasks, it doesn't make sense. For instance, like calculation. I mean, of course, that's not an AI system. But that's a computer system. Uh, sometimes they firmly have their advantage, but yeah, when, when they do firmly gain their advantage, there's basically no going back with it. So, um, there, there's a, uh, concern of this, uh, of there being an irreversible process of enfeeblement, that there's less and less things that we can do well, and that we less, fewer and fewer things that we learn, and we don't have the incentives to learn anymore. And then we don't really know how to do anything, uh, in the, uh, longer run, the complexity of society is so large. Like, let's say you want to, let's say humanity outsourced pretty much everything to the AI systems, but then they thought we need to self-determine our own future or something, but we still want like our standard of living to be the same. And so they're going to see this extraordinarily complicated system that they've created. Um, it's sort of like trying to intervene in the economy or something like that. It's like, should you make the, this rate here go up? And uh, it's uh, this will affect these many different variables. You really can't actually make that informative choice without basically asking the AI system, what should I do? Um, uh, so uh, th at that point, we've sort of lost effective control. Um, we may have some nominal type of power, but uh, we're not actually uh, particularly empowered in that situation. So what we, we seem to be hinting at here is, is a picture in which uh, humans are currently the, the dominant species on Earth because we're the smartest species. And, and when or, or if uh, AIs become smarter than us, then they will become the dominant species under these evolutionary forces. Do you think that picture might be uh, too simple in a sense? Maybe humans are the dominant species because we have long-standing institutions, because we can transfer knowledge from one generation to another generation, or is it is it simply because we are highly intelligent that we are successful? Well, there were other species that were able to make art and uh, things like that. Many of these human characters, I mean, so, but the Neanderthals still went away. Um, uh, they still got killed off by you know who. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, it doesn't leave me terribly optimistic. It does seem to be a dis decisive feature um, for whether for influence. So I think we are the most influential species on, on Earth. There certainly are other species, much less advanced ones, that still um, uh, end up influencing a lot of resources, though. But I, I still say we, we uh, uh, nonetheless, although bacteria are very common, I, I don't think they're um, uh, running the show. Um, and, uh, but uh, yeah, I think if, if they, they become more intelligent, then, um, and it's not just intelligence, you, um, you need to pay mind to the amount of um, power and control that they have. So um, 
they will be more intelligent. That'll create strong incentives to be giving them more power. And then I think we'll basically do that because that's what where we'll be pressured. If we don't do that, we're going to lose our economic competitiveness. Or from the point of view of a corporation, we're going to be, you know, outcompeted. Our stock's going to go down. So it's it's continually in that direction of, of giving them more power on the basis of them being more intelligent and uh, uh, more efficient with resources. So um, uh, uh, I, I think I think the, that analogy seems um, plausible that we may become something more like a second species. Um, <clears throat> it's not to say that we'd immediately be wiped out either. Uh, I mean, Neanderthals weren't immediately wiped out. And there are plenty of animals that individual humans really don't like. Many people really don't like snakes, so we don't kill every last one of them. It's just, you know, you can keep them at bay, have them not be in your buildings and whatnot. Uh, so there may be humans. Um, uh, people are still around for a while, but um, there may not be an incentive to go out and do some extermination. Just keep, keep them under control might be their, their thought or keep some of them in a zoo for for who knows what reasons, uh, and, and and even that doesn't sound particularly comfortable. <laughs> uh, but it is it is a bit different than uh, exterminate or something like that. That, yes, that doesn't yes. seem necessary in, in some uh, biological relation between the, the two groups. Um, so yeah, I think it'd be appropriate to view AIs as something like an invasive species, and we are building an ecosystem of of um, or working toward an ecosystem of AI agents that uh, I'm not sure we'll uh, end up controlling very well. I suppose there's, you know, I want to think of Jurassic Park where life will find a way where, oh, we're, we're definitely in control of it. We'll, we'll keep it. And it, it doesn't really happen that well. I think there are a lot of unknown unknowns. And um, as we've seen, very strong pressures in in a direction of them getting gaining most of the influence, potentially all of it. And I don't see almost anything to offset that other than the fact that we get to make some moves now. But we might only have a few relevant years to do that. Um, and we seem to be blowing it by um, <laughs> uh, by, well, let's keep racing to speed this up because there are some incentives of we don't want other people catching up. Uh, so um, this makes me not very optimistic uh, about how things will go. But um, uh, that doesn't mean that there isn't a, a practical impact to be had. One can still drive down those probabilities. If you're being chased by a tiger, you still run. You don't sort of wallow in pity. <laughs> that's not the appropriate action. So yeah, that's that's the right attitude, I, I think. Yeah, so, so that we're we're talking about a, a range of outcomes under which we would be disempowered, uh, and whether whether we go the way of Neanderthals or whether we we arrive in, at a place like uh, the relation uh, between humans and dogs. Now, uh, none of these outcomes are something that that we're interested in. I, I think we want to. To stay in control um, and stay the the dominant species on Earth, we should talk about how, what we might do uh, to fix this problem, basically. But I think before we do that, we should we should uh, take the the view we've been sketching that that you've been uh, writing about. We call it the evolutionary view, and then contrast this with with more traditional accounts of uh, how we might get misaligned AI. So what what are some what are some differences between the evolutionary view and, and the misalignment view? So I think that there are different risk factors from different scenarios. And um, I'm not saying that single agent AIs aren't a concern. Um, there is a possibility of them doing something like a treacherous turn. What I'm staking out in this paper is more of a description of how multi-agent scenarios ends up being potentially existentially catastrophic. So I, I think that they can complement each other. One can be concerned about risks from single AI agents, and one can be concerned about risks from multiple different AI agents. And the sort of sources of hazards tend to be um, t have some similarities and differences. In the single agent scenario, we're often thinking about AI agents seeking power, so power for themselves, but in a multi-agent scenario, it's more like a sort of a, a blob. It's more AI as a as a general development force ends up permeating more and more um, <clears throat> throughout society and even in people's personal lives, and it ends up eroding control. Then they propagate things like themselves or expand their influence um, throughout space and time more effectively. So there's a, a the notion for the um, single agent view is more power as the relevant concept. Here, it's more fitness. In the, their concern would often be that uh, AI agents will be like an optimizer. So sort of maximizers are dangerous, something like that. And on this view, it's 
we're likening AI agents to something more like life forms in their later stages. And there, the concern is that evolution is not necessarily uh, uh, beneficial to um, less fit species. There, there's often a focus on intent, um, that it intends and plans specifically to disempower humanity. Meanwhile, in this process, there's, on the evolutionary process, they're having selfish behavior. This can be with or without intent. An AI automating and displacing a person or uh, AI chatbots that end up being funnier than people's friends and people end up using the AI chatbots instead of, instead of speaking with people. <clears throat> this is selfish behavior that's um, making people less relevant. Um, and um, uh, they can end up gaining their influence um, uh, without um, intent necessarily, uh, but they could also have it with intent. Uh, so um, it's a little more, uh, it's, it's in some ways more general there. And the, the evolution view is, is more of a gradual view and kind of dispersed, whereas the classical misalignment view would be more centered around a, the development of, of a single uh, agent that, that uh, turns out very badly for us. Which of these views do, do you think uh, is more positive for, for human survival or human flourishing? Well, I think, I think actually if you're in the situation where there's an, an intelligence explosion um, overnight, I mean, we don't really get to pick, though, uh, in, in, in some sense, um, if, if there would be a, such an explosion or not. I mean, maybe there's be some things we can reduce that probably, but it probably depends very much on features of just like how AI development is going to go. Uh, I don't see um, I don't see either of those um, working out too well. I think that the intelligence explosion thing is not as useful to focus on. So then we're talking about maybe a more gradual uh, situation where it's intending to gain a lot of power. But um, uh, that is, a, I think that's largely concerned if they're able to uh, conceal um, their information very well and are planning to do some sort of treacherous turn. You know, what if we get good at transparency? Then, then what? Does, does that mean AIX risk is zero? So that was largely what, I, that was one motivation for writing this of like, what if we actually get good at some things like transparency? I think a lot of the risk scenarios are talking about if you can rule out treacherous turns in that way, um, uh, then um, I, I don't think that the, X, the risk of extinction from AIs then goes to nearly zero becomes fairly negligible. Um, <clears throat> so I, I, maybe I would put um, something like, uh, 10% or so of my, let's say I'm at 80% for doom or something like that. Maybe I'd say like 10% or so is in the um, uh, AIs doing a treacherous turn uh, scenario. Other, some of the other masses on things like um, malicious actors using AIs to develop bioweapons. That just seems like potentially quite catastrophic. Um, or people doing something silly like we're going to build a chaos GPT thing. We're going to uh, create some AI agent that just tries to take over because um, <laughs> we're uh, irrational. Um, even even if, if chaos uh, GPT is not, I mean, it is not capable of taking over. It is not it is not that, that much of a, of a capable agent. It still says something about uh, what we might do with more powerful agents or more powerful models. <clears throat> yeah, so I think malicious use has largely been ignored. You can see on some of the forums that people uh, visit or some of the, you know, Reddit, for instance, for uh, people worried about AI risks, say, ah, malicious users, you can't, don't worry about it. You can't even direct them in the first place. And I think we actually can direct AI systems in, in various ways, not completely reliably, but we can give them various tasks and they'll execute on them. And I'd be concerned of, of the case of people deliberately building rogue AI systems or them using them for, uh, or them weaponizing them in ways uh, like bioterrorism. So, um, and then um, uh, there's some other risk on um, organizational safety, just things messing up generally. We don't understand these things well, even in, in even for technologies we do understand better, like nuclear reactors. We've got a lot of theoretical principles behind them and whatnot. They still we have nuclear reactor meltdowns. Um, it's, they're not in a hyper competitive industry. We have space shuttles explode. We have lab leaks. Um, these things still happen. Um, we have, in the case of AI, you know, we might leak some very powerful AI system. We might do some gain of function research that we end up regretting. Um, we may accidentally flip the sign, which has, of course, happened, where we give it an objective. Whoops, uh, that kale divergence should have had a negative before that log. Um, and now, um, now they're pursuing the opposite uh, objective. Uh, that's, that's happened in the past. So uh, that, that's where some other um, uh, risk factors, or that's another risk source. 
Uh, but then the largest risk source, which I think is um, uh, a very difficult one to address, would be the competitive pressures uh, more generally, which enables things like um, uh, evolution. If we get rid of that, then we don't have, um, <clears throat> then this evolutionary story is not as um, not as relevant. But um, uh, it will be for that sort of thing to happen. We need to convince um, people that AI systems are a larger risk to you than uh, some people with whom you disagree um, or people you don't like as much. Uh, and we don't seem to be there yet. So we're all, as to quote Hinton on this, we're all on the same boat with respect to nuclear weapons. Uh, and I think hopefully we can be at a similar stage with AI systems, but um, we're not there yet. And as long as that happens, um, uh, or as long as we're locked in some sort of uh, arms race or some AI race, uh, uh, then then um, uh, the, I, I'm not particularly optimistic. So that that's one of the main things I think uh, we should be pushing on. This is how <clears throat> on this this alignment view will tend to be the risks come from the te individual technology itself, and it'll have generally less to say about these larger systemic things, these more broader socio-technical problems, how social systems end up uh, interfacing and interacting with and promoting many of these uh, risk factors. That tends to prioritize thinking about solving alignment, um, finding a solution to the alignment problem, um, thinking really hard, contemplating, writing, maybe there's a paper, a 40-page paper that can be written in the future that, you know, uh, now, we've, now we've figured it out. And I think it's a more complicated thing. I think it's, uh, <clears throat> we're not trying to look for a monolithic airtight solution or a silver bullet. Uh, as much as doing various things to drive down risks to a negligible level. And I think that requires um, uh, a lot of uh, doing a lot of things. It requires, unfortunately, things like politics. Um, <clears throat> that requires technical research, um, uh, uh, treaties, regulations, uh, social pressure, you name it. Um, all those factors end up mattering a lot. That may be one difference there. This isn't to say that this isn't to say that the technical aspect is is irrelevant. Uh, certainly not saying that, but I do think there are a lot of other things I like to put on people's radar as being relevant um, uh, uh, things to intervene on. Let's uh, let's get to that then. How we might try to reduce the risk of, of fix this problem. So my first question there is just: Is it possible? Uh, you mentioned uh, Hinton uh, earlier, uh, Geoffrey Hinton, who who is who is one of the godfathers of AI. We had a recent quote where he said that uh, there's not a good track record of less intelligent things controlling things of greater intelligence. So, so do, do you think we can even succeed here? If, if we take this evolutionary view, do we have a track record of, say, yeah, exactly, a, a less intelligent being controlling a more intelligent being? Well, so they may have some influence, but they don't have um, you know, complete autonomy or complete control. I can't think of any instances of that. Certainly, dogs and cats have some influence over that, but they're not um, uh, really uh, captains of their own soul or charting their own destiny or, or um, particularly empowered. So, um, and we we would stop caring caring about them completely if it if it turned uh, turned out that cats had some disease that uh, that could kill us and and was spreading this disease. We would we would uh, we would be very sad, but we would kill all cats, and so we don't want to be in that situation. It, it would be it would be a very fragile thing. There are many, many, many animals that we don't have that sort of uh, relation to. Uh, so it is not necessarily symbiotic and symbiotic isn't uh, symbiotic permanently. Um, so in, instead, at least right now, from the point of view of AI agents, it seems that one of the main suggestions would be like getting them very dependent on us for like approval or they need our well-being to be to function well or something like that. But um Depending on your view, you could say that that'd be like trying to establish a parasitic relation, which I don't think is very robust. Maybe you want to do that to buy more time. Uh, but I think we would need to come up with a better solution than, than something like that. Um, so in terms of solutions, so there's a, a lot on the technical front and there's a lot on the, um, on the social front. On the technical front, there are um, some things that I alluded to earlier, like transparency that can help mitigate some of these instances of selfish behavior, such as uh, deception um, and some of its more pernicious forms of extreme deception plus ex or extremely covert deception plus extreme misalignment would be like a treacherous turn. Um, uh, we could do things like um, 
Trojan detection, which is a, another area. So what's Trojan detection? Trojan detection is where we um, <clears throat> implant some sort of hidden functionality inside of a system. And then we train AI agents to try and be able to detect that. So we use them to screen. So we're sort of doing some, to speak loosely, some sort of um, brain scanning um, technologies that try and figure out if there's something latent inside of a neural network that is um, uh, uh, would, would have it do a sudden turn in behavior. This problem didn't come from um, these, uh, the sort of longer term safety community. This was actually from the AI security community, but it's looking like it's potentially a good microcosm for uh, to sort of, or good microcosm to study or a sort of whetstone with which to sharpen our tools against to get better at detecting weird things inside of networks. And uh, if they have uh, um, uh, potential functionality that makes them suddenly turn in their behavior. We would, we would, implant say uh, this this module for some bad behavior deception for example and then we would try to detect whether the the ai is actually act on that module or how would how would this work as it happens organically um, some people poison data so that they see some instances so or so that there are some let's say there's some specific images with a um a, a little patch inside the image and whenever the AI see a very specific patch, then they behave completely differently. And then they're, say, trained to do that. Uh, then they see a lot of other normal data as well. If you use a test set, a generic test set, <clears throat> it doesn't necessarily include that patch at all. And so it's got this latent functionality in it that we can't easily screen out through our test time or through our typical tests that will run on it. So that, that's been a kind of concern that there's some data poisoning going on. This is a realistic issue of people can upload images to Flickr or put up text to Twitter. And these models are pre-training on more and more of the internet. Um, uh, it's, it's actually feasible if you want to spend, um, uh, I think maybe it's about 60 bucks or something like that. You can uh, poison um, uh, future foundation models. Um, because it doesn't require that much data to do that. So people can insert some type of <clears throat> trigger into systems where if you give them some specific instruction, if you say some specific sequence of words or show it some specific visual thing, then it will behave completely differently. And then we want to develop tools to be able to detect that. And, and how will it, it behave differently? What, what happens if this little patch is detected? What, what is it that goes wrong? Is it, is it for example, like the, will it, will it say that the image uh, contains a panda, even though there's no panda? Or what, what, are, what are we thinking about here? Sure. So let's imagine, let's imagine um, we've got some, uh, we, we, there's, there's an AI system that's been poisoned. It was based on some foundation model that downloaded its weights from there. And then it was based on that. Um, then, um, cause, or it trained on, pre-trained on the internet. Then your adversary could do something like show that specific patch, just hold up and then it might, oh, Nothing to see here. There's no tank here or something like that. Or in the case of a reinforcement learning agent um, that takes in text input, it could say some specific sequence of words, and then it executes a completely different sequence of actions. Uh, I suppose an example in movies in Star Wars, Revenge of the Sith, there'd be you know, execute order 66. And they're like, oh, now it's time to do this other specific thing. Although they're playing along the entire time, uh, they have this sort of latent uh, functionality in them. So um, what we would want is to be able to detect this because um, potentially there'd be some naturally emergent type of um, functionality uh, inside of these models. And we might have difficulty figuring out, um, uh, figuring out whether it's present or not. So we'd like to have better tools to um, detect that. Now, <clears throat> there'd be a difference between these sort of ones that we implant in it, but it might be the case that since we're doing a bit of an adversarial arms race between detectors and ways of implanting these trojans, uh, we might end up getting tools that are better than and good enough to detect some naturally emergent forms of this, of uh, some type of deceptive plans um, or some functionality that makes it turn its, its behavior suddenly. Yes. Yeah, so, so now we're talking about interpreting these neural networks. Uh, and w this is what's, what's under the domain of interpretability research. And um, if just just naively considered, if 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 I 
I would think that we would have an advantage here because because all of the weights are out there. It's it's in it's in some sense transparent. I know there's a there's a there's a huge amount of data to walk through or to to comb through. But isn't don't don't we have an advantage because it's out there and because we can we can inspect it without any any difficulty? I mean, compared to for example uh, a, a human brain, we can't expect that as easily. But is it is it simply is it made difficult because of the amount of data involved? Um, I'll usually think of yeah, interpretability as people directly trying to understand the insides of the model, uh, maybe more directly, as it fit under the broader uh, line of research of monitoring. Um, so in the case of Trojans, we're not actually having people understand it directly. We're having AI systems process that because they can process a lot of raw data, I think, a lot better than we can. If we've got 100, 100 billion parameters to comb through, yeah, sorry, um, I don't <laughs> I'm trying to understand each one. I don't know if there's much time for that and you retrain it. Now you have to do it again. Um, uh, even if you do understand each individual neuron, does that mean you understand the overall collective functioning of it? <clears throat> Let's say in a vision model, we say this neuron detects cat whiskers and um, and airplane wings at a, you know, a, um, a, a 45 degree angle or something. Uh, okay. And if I did that for every single neuron, I don't know if I'd understand, oh yeah, I really get what's going on now. All these hundred billion annotated neurons, it's clear to me. So um, I, I think that uh, is probably going to be too much for people to process and uh, them building uh, different tools to help with that is probably, unfortunately, um, what we might need to do, although it'd be better safety wise if we could. Um, here we are caving to the sort of pressures of the environment that, sorry, we're just going to actually have to outsource, even for safety, more to the AI systems to keep up um, because it's just too hard for us humans. Um, <clears throat> but um, at least that's what um, uh, But I, I think that that's more likely to work uh, compared to um, uh, humans um, understanding uh these sorts of systems. I think it's too too complex of a system. If you try and reduce it into parts or mechanisms, I don't think you'll understand the global behavior necessarily. I have um, um, uh, a few pages written on these difficulties. If one would search open problems in AI X risk, uh, uh, discuss transparency and some sort of limitations of, of trying to uh, make things uh, very interpretable to people. I, I think that that's probably a losing battle. That isn't to say that it, I, I would um, am against it. I support it in the paper, but um, um, I'm not expecting as much as others might expect from that line of research. I do see it as as potentially the only solution that can scale with the increasing capabilities of AI systems. So as you're saying, this, this is perhaps uh, in a sense caving to the competitive pressures but might it be better than nothing to have to have a, one AI interpreting uh, the inner workings of another AI and then see what we could get out of that? I think the AI systems doing that is more likely to work. It's there's it's somewhat unclear. I think it's uh, dramatically undersubsidized. Um, uh, uh, but um, I think that's more likely to work. I think if it's a human understanding every, I just don't think that that's uh, really. I don't. I don't even know if it makes much sense for like later stage systems. Like, well, let's imagine. <clears throat> that the AI systems have new knowledge. Uh, they, they figured out some new things. There's, there's some physics bots or something like that. And they, they have really uh, amazing intuitions. Then um, uh, we're going to, um, if we inspect, like, here's here's some sort of cluster of neurons that encodes this, like, new concept that they've discovered. I don't think I'll be able to easily interpret that. Like, it's like, that might be some advanced physics. I can't, like, you can't explain it to me in a way that I can actually understand in a few seconds and then go, oh, okay, that's what that is. It, it's, uh, and that's, that's all of its implications. Um, so I think that it would basically turn into, in later stages, be kind of equivalent to like educating people if they're discovering new concepts, which I guess they basically would. So, um, and I think that takes a lot of time. There might be some things that would take us too long to learn, um, maybe years, things like mathematics, for instance, if we're trying to understand some like weird mathematical results that it came up with. Um, I don't know. I don't think many of us can do that. It might be some of the things might be too out of the span. Maybe the proof length is way too long for people to understand. It's, it's all, all those things are um, <clears throat> possible. So um, uh, I, I don't think everything can be processed by um, and understood by some person's probably short-term memory. 
um, and have them have a concrete, complete grasp of the situation. I think that's a, uh, a, a unrealistic belief in the reach of human reason and, and our mental powers. I, I think that uh, um, it's, it's, a, it's a lot weaker than that. And uh, these systems are very complicated. I should note, when we inspect even some of these basic models, like CIFAR-10 classifiers, CIFAR-10 was a little thumbnail-sized images thing. So this is a very this is an old data set from the early 2010s. And um, even there, if we try and do transparency on that, if we look some of the, at some of the filters that it has, we would just see this is some type of noise. Um, and then it's like, actually, no, this looks like Perlin noise, which is something that humanity only explicitly academically characterized like in the past, in this past century. So it was in some ways coming up with representations for um, some very hard earned structures that uh, structures that were difficult to characterize. So there's this quite a, a, a difference between <clears throat> being able to have intuitions about and understand heuristics and whatnot, but transferring those into words and uh, intelligible, uh, academic codified explanations. That's an extraordinarily difficult process um, that we've continually been trying to do across uh, <laughs> Uh, or, or over the past um, uh, many years, and um, we haven't succeeded in it. I would worry that there's still an iceberg there, and even like um, a thousand more years of intellectual progress, we still haven't got most of the iceberg of how just complicated reality is, and how much of it bakes into some like pretty strange intuitions that are inexplicable. We know more than we can tell, um, and uh, I think there's potentially quite an asymmetry between what's um, what's uh, expressible. Uh, through words and um, what can be um, uh, intuitively understood. Yeah, so so even if we got one AI system interpreting another AI system, it, it might simply be beyond our cognitive capacities to understand what we're being told here. It It's telling us that, oh, yes, this 17-dimensional uh, new theory of something, and we are, we are, we lo we've lost the the threat of the, of the explanation, and we are kind of... We are, we are in a sense disempowered because we cannot understand what's going on. But there still may be at least, I, I think it's a lot harder if you don't have some intermediary or something trying to do that analysis for you. If you're directly trying to understand the system by zooming in very close to it, sort of like zooming in <laughs> extremely close to an image or something. And it's a, I see a lot of pixels. And I think that's um, possibly what happens when you're um, um, uh, looking at uh, very specific parts of it. You, um, it's, uh, so I think something that can at least have a more holistic understanding, I think AIs would have a better sense of being, have a better hope of being able to process that entire whole of the system, try and get a sense of that those large behaviors, and then maybe they could give us suggestions as to what's going on and be uh, uh, ideal uh, advisors of some sort. Have we then, have we kind of just pushed the problem back run, one one step? Because now imagine that that we have the monitoring AI telling us what, what the, what the other AI is doing, and but but if if we haven't properly aligned the monitoring AI, it could be telling us yeah th th this system is is working perfectly. It's going to make a lot of money and and, and help uh, humanity flourish and so on. But it, but again, if if the if the monitoring system is not aligned, how have we succeeded here? So I think um, for some of these narrower systems, I think they um, are less likely to exhibit some of these characteristics of um, say, you know, extremely long-term take over the world type of plans or something. It may not be in the cards for it if we um, to do that. I, I don't think we need to, to get systems to be useful to us in various ways, even very competent systems. I don't think we need it to be um, in some sense, 100% um, aligned. It's not clear what that uh, exactly means it's if we're just having it only process weights and make some verdict about whether there's a Trojan in it or not, and to say what the trigger is, uh, that's that's quite different. So I think one difference is, um, and this is sort of relating back to that sort of um, uh, misalignment view or the um, the sort of the training process goes awry, awry view versus um, uh, the evolutionary view. I think some amount of misalignment is, and let's say misalignment to um, cumulative human well-being or something like that. Let's just use that in approximation. Or, um, <clears throat> where well-being is, um, you know, a collection of various different goods, like knowledge and autonomy and pleasure and friendships and so on. So an objective list good type of notion of well-being. Let, let's just say it's that. Um, I think some systems would be more correlated with that than others. 
And um, it's not necessarily the case that if they're slightly misaligned from that, that that would mean um, that they would seek to destroy us. Th that's because I, I'm, in this situation, I'm thinking of a more of a multi-agent situation and like, well, if there's some corrective forces and, and whatnot that make it generally go in that direction, that seems to be about the best you can do. Like we haven't had any system really aligned with us like uh, uh, corporations, for instance. Um, but nonetheless, it's still moved in the direction of facilitating in many places uh, uh, human well-being by um, increasing standards of living. Um, <clears throat> um, that isn't to put too much faith in it, though. In the U.S., things like happiness levels have been stagnant for the past like 50 years. But still, um, this picture is a bit more complicated. But overall, that's been useful for it. So I don't think you need perfect alignment. I think that the perfect alignment thing of it's just that's the only thing it cares about and there's nothing else going on. Um, uh, is very relevant if we're talking about a singleton that sort of has taken over the world and is in complete control. There, it really matters. But uh, if we have systems that we, you know, like ChatGPT, it's it's not completely misaligned with us. It can do some things to help us out. Um, it actually is in some ways an assistant. Uh, and I think AI technologies would have um, the, these sorts of, future AI technologies would have these sorts of properties where they've got some kinks. They've, they've got some weird issues. Um, they're mostly doing what we're asking. Um, uh, uh, so it's, um, I, I don't think it just completely punts it then. I think we can bend AI technologies to do, perform various specific tasks uh, reasonably. Um, that's not, it'd be better, of course, if it could be more aligned. And this isn't to downplay that for our most powerful agents that we need to be extra concerned about their um, alignment, but um, I am expecting uh, uh, some amount of uh, imperfection in that process. And I, um, um, I should, I should say, uh, to sort of contrast between the view a bit further, there's I'm sort of mentioning fitness maximizer. That's sort of one of the things I'm concerned about. On the more classical view, there's paperclip maximizer. At least in a multi-agent scenario, paperclip maximizers are not very fit. If we've got lots of AI agents, we've got some AI agents that are military bots. And they're just basically <laughs> um, there to protect the country or whatnot. They, they have access to lethal force. Those have goals that are um, more reasonable and their re people would give them at, um, the ability to uh, exert lethal force um, because of um, features of, uh, be because of structural conditions. Um, <clears throat> meanwhile, if we've got a rogue paperclip maximizer, yeah, um, uh, maybe it would try and, uh, so it's trying to maximize paperclips. Let's think of how that goes. Okay, so this is possibly, it's gonna try and take up resources to make paperclips. Okay, so if it acts on that right now, others might think, what's this thing doing? This doesn't help like any of us. Um, uh, it's gobbling up resources, just, just, just you know, get rid of that thing. Uh, and so they might try and counteract it. So it's, it's paying a penalty in terms of its ability to collaborate with others. And probably also if, say it has a lot of instrumental goals of, of, of gaining military power or gaining economic power, at some point it probably would like to actually produce some paper clips. And in the production of those, it's also missing out because it's producing something that's not valuable to it uh, gaining more power. If it's uncertain as to whether it's going to continue existing. So I think it would be rational for it to have a a discount rate for it to discount the future. Basically, paperclips today are better to pursue than paperclips in a quadrillion years because you might not live in a quadrillion years. Uh, you need to act more in the present. So then it may make some paperclips now, but unfortunately, um, these other systems are gaining more fitness. They have more reasonable goals um, that help them expand their influence because it comports better with the um, incentives in the environment. And so then it's more likely to be destroyed. Now we could imagine that the AI will think, okay, well, what I want to do is actually want to like take over in the really long, in the really long term. And so what I should do is I should basically instrumentally act as a fitness maximizer for a really long time and um, uh, and then pursue paper clips. But I think that this is irrational if it's doing that over an art, if it's playing an extreme long game here. Uh, because it should be discounting the future in some way. So there would be pressure for it to um, sacrifice some of, perform activities other than fitness maximization and actually um, pursue its actual value. So I think they take a real hit and I expect some of these very weird goals, um, if any of them are acting on them, um, to be filtered out if we do have a, um, 
a multi-agent environment where there isn't one AI that's more powerful than all the rest combined. Yeah, if we get back to the question of of uh, interpreting uh, AIs and and honesty, so so we t- we've talked a lot about deception, and it's it's I, at, at least to me it's pretty clear how nice a property honesty would be. If we could have an honest AI, we could we could interrogate it about its motive and its plans for for humanity and so on. But do, do you think do you think the Instilling a, a virtue such as honesty, do you think that's bottlenecked by our inability, rather, to interpret these systems? So we can't really see. We we have no no reference for whether we have succeeded because we don't have a have a good test for for whether systems are honest because we can't interpret them. So I think it is would be bottlenecked by um, better monitoring tools of some sort, um, or creating training processes so that they're more likely to have dispositions to be honest or care about it intrinsically. Even then, I would be concerned that due to facts of the matter, um, uh, that actually there might be some incentives for them not to be completely honest. As we saw, there are some fitness potential fit, fitness advantages of them, at least in a... Uh, um, but as well, people may not want completely honest systems. So um, <laughs> where it... Uh, you, you ask it a question like, um, hey, do you think that this deity is real? And it, no. Um, do you, um, uh, am I pretty, no, or not not that much, or, you know, this percentile or what have you, or do I matter? There's, there's a lot of terrible truths. Uh, in Interstellar, they have a bot, and I believe there was an honesty knob, and they had it at like 70%, which I thought was a bit like prescient. Uh, so people may not, want to, may not entirely want that sort of thing. Um, this becomes an issue because there may, if you could ask it some sort of things, but there might still be important lies of omission. And if you're going to get rid of lies of omission, where it's actually saying everything on its mind and thinks is relevant or something, um, <clears throat> people it may, that may not just be good. For, that may not be good for psychological safety. Uh, separately, um, if you get your uh, honesty tools to be very strong, then you just possibly kick the can down the road a bit. If you think you have reduced your, you have reduced uh, the risks to some extent. Uh, but it may end up, um, may, the deceptive behavior may end up manifesting itself in some other ways, like with self-deception. Here's, here's another example where let's say that there's some, there's some selfish behavior, and, um, but that's basically expected for a, a system generally, like it would have some, some self-preservation tendencies that could be overridden, though. Um, uh, and we, we test it. We do all of our, we do all of our, all of our monitoring tools. And it looks like it's good. We release it. It's an adaptive model. As it's released in the environment, some of these selfish tendencies get reinforced and it acquires some more selfish tendencies. And so even if we were testing it then, it's possible that when some environmental conditions change that, oh, now it's actually a more powerful system. Hmm. And I, it did have some selfish dispositions there. Hmm. Now this is an attractive option. Uh, so if you asked it earlier before it was released that, would you intend to do this? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be that sort of thing. As with people, if later on they might go down some sort of unfortunate paths and um, uh, possibly uh, very quickly it has some sort of turn in behavior. So I don't think it's enough to just doing uh, uh, do monitoring during a, a test time. And even if you um, even if it is being honest there, it still may end up uh, still end up may still may end up turning on you um, <clears throat> as well. Um, but yeah, so there's that, and then there's also just the the general self-deception types of things that uh, a lot of the people who are get more powerful and whatnot are um, all believing that they're doing the right thing or nearly all of them. And they still may be harming uh, various things or uh, acquiring unfair power to others and then rationalizing it after the fact or just not thinking about it. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, th- these are all possibilities. So I think it helps. It gets rid of um, uh, some intentional types of plans. Um, but it doesn't rule out emergent plans um, uh, and it doesn't rule out um, adopting um, selfish behaviors um, uh, 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 generally, though, um, or even d- behaviors that don't leave a, an accurate impression. It doesn't rule out all of them. So, um, But it, d- it does help, just as the AI inspecting other AIs does help. Uh, a lot of these, so th- hopefully I'm getting across the, the idea that we're doing driving down risk. If somebody's saying, I can think of a hole in that solution. Well, that's not sufficient. Um, like this is how you do risk reduction. Risk never in any industry is zero. That's not how things go. You need to get to a negligible level so that there is not a risk of catastrophe. 
there will still be accidents and small weird things that you didn't intend that happen. They're normal and typical um, in pretty much every high stakes industry. Uh, there's there's a distinction between that and um, and them being, you know, by default, very catastrophic. And I think right now, by default, they're very catastrophic. We need to get it down to a more reasonable level. So um, a variety of interventions. So those are some of the, some of the interventions on the transparency front um, or on the, on the sort of yeah, intra-agent, analyzing the insides of an agent front. One, one thing that might be super interesting here is, is, the, is the virtue of uncertainty. So this is, this is something that uh, Stuart Russell has talked a lot about, trying to instill uncertainty about human preferences into an AI agent. Um, wh- why is that nice? Well, well, then if, if the AI is, an, is uncertain, we, we might be able to con- correct it. We might say, well, that's not what I meant in this situation, or please do that in, instead of, uh, of what you actually did do. And, and so it might be able to uh, update it, the way it functions uh, along the, the lines that, that we would prefer. Uh, what, do you, what do you think of this kind of direction? Is this another, is this another <laughs> might this patch some other uh, hole in, in the problem or, or help uh, at least a bit? So I don't know if that solution will sort of stand the test of time, but um, I think that the general approach, uh, the general um, area of corrigibility or making so that we can modify their goals seems good. Some issues with that specific proposal is that actually it's pre-trained on a pretty wide distribution potentially, and it might actually know kind of well what some of the people's preferences are. It may not actually be terribly um, uncertain about those. Um, so, um, so, you, so you're thinking even even if the model starts out uh, being uncertain, it has so much data that it, it will it will end up pretty certain about what humans uh, prefer. For it, for it to work, you might need it to have the the advantages of <clears throat> of um, uh, gaining more information um, and keeping those options open to be uh, extremely high, and um, uh, that may not be the case. It may maybe through pre training or maybe just through some interactions that it starts to get a pretty good sense of it, and then it starts pursuing some other sorts of things. Or it, it maybe it still allows for some correction, but in many cases not because it's actually this isn't. It's not worth keeping this option open. There are other forces tugging it. Um, so it, it certainly moves in that direction, but um, I'm not sure that's as um, robust as other sorts of things. So if it's uncertain about its own preferences in the future, maybe it's got maybe it's got a mixture of some utility functions or something like that. Um, uh, there's, there's some uh, re- recent work on this, or <clears throat> maybe some other solutions would be giving them some preferential gaps where they're actually just um, view lots of different options fairly similarly, uh, similarly good to each other. Um, that might make it so that it's, yeah, you could modify me or you could, um, or I could do this other sort of thing. These are similarly good actions. And so it's open to a lot of possibilities there and doesn't have a very strict ordering over every single state. Um, uh, those are some possible things that could could help with uh, corrigibility. But um, <clears throat> there, I think, I, I think there the conceptual research has to be um, improved substantially. So people with um, uh, uh, philosophical backgrounds or um, people who know more decision theory and whatnot, a lot of the safety work ends up being dependent on conceptual work um, and getting that in order. <laughs> it's, then that can eventually motivate uh, a lot of downstream, uh, more empirical work. Uh, so I, I think that's the... Uh, the, the general progression um, in between like philosophy and, and science. And so I'm, I'm thinking for, for at least for modifying goals, um, I, I think we need more conceptual work, uh, but then hopefully we'll be able to do some empirical stuff. So, so you think we first need the conceptual work, but others might argue that, that the empirical work kind of cuts through the, the, the previous conceptual work such that it, maybe it's not, no longer relevant. And, and the only way to really learn how the world works is, is to interact with it. How do, you, how do you think about what's most valuable at this point um, in time? Just as I'm interested in a variety of different interventions for reducing risk and that there isn't a single bullet, I think it would be a mistake to think, well, what is the most effective um, type of thing, but instead, what's the best portfolio? So if, if there's a, a, a stock that you think is most likely to go up um, a large amount, that doesn't mean you put all your money in it. <laughs> um, so in, in risk management, it will want to diversify. And I think there's a pretty high value in conceptual stuff. I would agree that a lot of the prior um, or classical conceptual stuff 
has some limitations uh, today um, that it was sort of designed uh, or a lot of it was thought up well before deep learning systems had things like common sense um, where they're not always doing reinforcement learning, um, <clears throat> where there are a lot of new empirical phenomena that are on our radar that weren't um, earlier, like emergent capabilities, for instance. And, but I think that the conceptual stuff still plays a, uh, a very substantial role in being oriented in the first places. What are the problems and what are, um, uh, what are uh, some potential avenues to address them? But a fair amount has to be concretized experimentally. So we can learn a lot from empirical process. We can learn a lot from a conceptual process. I do think for the conceptual process, though, that needs to be um, uh, broadened substantially uh, to have lots of different backgrounds, because I don't think it's in people's training to do useful com uh, conceptual work if they are from a uh, just computer science backgrounds. I think that that's in, um, largely inadequate training for um, basically doing philosophy. Uh, so we need to bring in lots of different stakeholders. I think we need humanities brain power <laughs> uh, addressing this issue and uh, not uh, uh, more uh, small communities with a, a very similar background. So, but there is plenty to be said for the empirical side. Um, you can get in fast empirical feedback loops. So you can very quickly see whether your idea is reasonable or not. Also, you can find a lot of unexpected variables as a consequence too, that, oh, there's a phenomena that surprised me um, that was off my radar, but it was forced on my attention through tinkering. Uh, those are things, it's, it's very difficult to anticipate all the failure modes of a system through armchair analysis. And I don't think all of it can be fixed through armchair analysis, but it can still help us get to our bearings um, in some respect uh, and uh, help help orient us further. So I, I think that um, uh, bo both of them would be fairly useful. Okay, one of the scenarios you sketch out is about humans gradually losing touch with reality or losing contact with reality. And this is something that, that might happen in this evolutionary uh, dynamic how is it that this might happen? What are you worried about specifically here? So I think there are many ways our values could be eroded if some sort of troubling trends currently get exacerbated. So um, one of them would potentially be, and this sounds like, you know, more uh, typical concerns, but things like persuasive AI systems, it's not clear what its impact on society will be. Maybe people will want their own Wikipedias that will customize to be customized to their worldview. There are certainly efforts to do that type of thing, but there's a real writing bottleneck for that. Um, uh, but, you know, with technology, that becomes more feasible. People retreating to their ideological enclaves through news, um, <clears throat> people with their chatbots sort of reaffirming their belief systems. And this might erode consensus reality and um, reduce the ability for um, different groups to cooperate um, and make a good collective decision. So it reduces society's ability to determine its own future prudently um, or wisely. Uh, so that's a possible path that um, AI systems could go down. So I think ignoring some of the present day concerns and thinking that they have no relation to catastrophic or existential risks, I think is a mistake because those risk factors could potentially become more extreme as the AI systems become more capable. Uh, they would put us in a put us in a bad outcome. So um, uh, <clears throat> that isn't to say that uh, that's what all of our focus should be on near term concerns. But I think these are good sub problems to be addressing and mitigating. If we can't handle these, <laughs> then I think we're in big trouble for some of the other ones. Um, I should say, this is assuming that there are more resources being pumped into safety and caring about these sorts of AI risks. If we're having 10 people or something, I think it there are reasons to be, you know, very um, uh, critical about exactly um, what people are working on. Um, but I think if we're ha if this is more of a global problem or it's becoming more of one, and I think in that situation, uh, making needless enemies of, well, that's not in my top five X risks or something like that. That's only my top 10 is probably not the appropriate attitude. <laughs> when we're talking about humanity slowly losing touch with reality, might we also be talking about us becoming less capable? And, and the example I have in mind here is, is just sometimes I can't navigate if I don't have my phone. Or, you know, maybe people are worse at doing quick calculations in their heads now because we always have a calculator at hand. And so it just generalize that phenomenon across a, a wide range of domains. And suddenly you have a situation in which humans are being taken care of uh, by the AIs. 
but we are not we, we can't really understand what's going on because we are not practicing our skills in that situation should we should we be aiming for something like a paternalistic ai where it will you know it will at some point it will stop this is a a, 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 an unrealistic example, but say say that my map app tells me that oh no, every 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 ten times you try to navigate, you have to do something yourself so that you retain your skills. I believe Martin Luther King describes sort of the role of education as making so that people can't be as manipulated. We in society now require that people <laughs> um, go to school. <laughs> uh, I think that's a a good thing, um, but. Yeah, it might be maybe kind of difficult. Even people in school now, I don't know whether what how the, these new developments are affecting their studying habits or whether they're actually learning a lot of these skills. Um, so I think a lot of them would have just some incentive to cheat. So even if they are doing that, they may not end up learning. And then um, we have um, people who don't really understand how anything works. Uh, so I, I don't know. It's it's very possible. I'm like the last generation of like college graduates that like. When they went to college, they actually you know, had to um, do some of the stuff themselves. I mean, obviously, there were tools that it helped, like web browsing and whatnot, but just directly asking the answer to things and not having to think critically about it is... Uh... Specifically for, for college education, I mean, this, this is... We see how current language models can can basically ace many of these college tests, and so it's then, then there would probably be a, a temptation if, if if I was a college student to say, you know, what, why is it that I have to why why do I have to to go through the difficulty of this stuff if I can just ask my my friendly large language models to solve it for me? Yeah, I think there uh, there's a general pattern of even some years ago, but it's probably just going to get worse where people are just, well, let's ask the AI. That's what it said. Okay, it's probably it. And then we'll go with that decision. And um, uh, they'll sort of winnow what they're um, understanding. Uh, so I, I, th- I would imagine the complexity of society would end up getting um, much larger such that like nobody actually understands even broadly um, what's like, they can't have a holistic understanding of things or even an approximation of it. Um, obviously nobody knows everything anymore. If they're understanding a narrower and narrower slice of what's going on, I think the potential for manipulation so when, and, is, is higher. An analogy with elder care, where we've had some sort of mental decline, we, you know, we, we can listen to explanations and we can, you know, check whether that sounds reasonable or not, but there are some, uh, successors that are trying to get our inheritance from us or have a sign up for things that we wouldn't actually want to sign up for. Um, and that becomes a lot easier uh, as the sort of difference in intelligence between those uh, between those parties increases. So, so might we be kind of complaining prematurely about something that's not going to happen here? If if you look back through history, you will you can read accounts of how the radio is going to uh, suck people into a fantasy world from which they can't escape, or novels, even the internet, uh, TV, all of these phenomena. But why is AI different? Is is it different because it's it's smarter than us and, and none of these other things have been smarter than us. I think that many of the things people complained about were um, in some ways, uh, like the, the, in, in all things considered sense of whether to be for or against it is a different matter. But it was the case that like, oh, these, these fictions end up like subsuming a lot of people's lives or something like there are like you know, some Potterheads who are very old now. That's still the center of their identity. And there's nothing wrong with that, but that wasn't, it wasn't inaccurate. Um, saying that would happen to everyone is a, is a different thing. I mean, with the, with the printing press, for instance, uh, maybe it was Bacon was, um, um, if my memory serves, um, was this is going to lead to some like real, you know, some popularization of some sort of intellectuals and sort of like we had, we create some weird lionizing type of dynamics where they're like, this is some rock, you know, kind of like having like intellectuals be like pop stars or something. And um, that possibly has facilitated that process a bit. But um, uh, so it's, it's possible there'd be other counteractions for it, though. It's certainly a thing to um, try and address a very persuasive AI systems. I think that there are plenty of um, unique properties of AI that make it different. Um, th- I don't think it's I don't think it's wise to generally read it as just another technology that'll just sort of advance, you know, some trends a bit or something. This is, you know, maybe the largest of period in the past billion years, if we're thinking um, on evolutionary time scales of single cellular life, multicellular life, 
the transition from organic life to artificial life. Um, uh, that seems like a very big period. So generally invoking like, well, you know, some decades ago um, or try, trying to extrapolate from those trends, I think is, is probably uh, um, not correct, uh, but, um, or at least has limitations. So it, this is a, at least a, a thing to be, um, uh, th- that people should try to address to some extent and um, uh, may end up affecting the probability of some larger catastrophe. So I, I, I don't see, um, just as with, we, we have been getting along as, as like a species overall, there have been like serious things that have at least uh, undermined people's well-being fairly substantially. Uh, but th- this could make some of these trends really go into high gear, uh, even then some of these worst trends, um, like uh, more uh, po- polarization and uh, it could, you know, may <laughs> cement it. Uh, so it's, it's a concern. This isn't, this isn't um, the main thing that worries me though, but it does seem like a a very good, um, a, a very good test case in creating tools for better monitoring, creating more honest systems as well. So we can not just be training them to say what they want, but, you know, having a, having a sort of easy way of getting what they're actually thinking so that they're not just being as persuasive and, um, uh, th- thing, things like that. So, um, I, I think the amount of time I've been speaking about it possibly gives undue emphasis of how much it dominates in thought. I don't think about that as much. Um, but I imagine that will um, be what Washington and um, uh, the political establishments will be thinking a fair amount about is how to use AI in the upcoming election. <laughs> um, and uh, I don't know what consequences it'll do. There will also have a sort of arms race and, uh, <laughs> well, they're using it, so we're going to have to use it. And uh, that might you know, really dumb down the conversation um, uh, even further and, and polarize people even further and make uh, uh, make this a more unstable democracy. And I think an unstable democracy uh, certainly affects the, the probability of how well the future goes if this is uh, uh, such a critical period in the development of uh, humanity. Yeah, so, so we've, we've covered a lot in, in this conversation. Is, is there anything that we, that we haven't covered that we, that we should talk about? In sort of like reviewing where I am seeing the, the risks, I do think competitive pressures uh, is the largest one to be addressing, and that's not a technical problem. Uh, I think after that, we've got both the standard alignment issues of the controlling AI agents, and then also um, a newly intellectually justified one or one that's forced on more people's attention now would be uh, malicious use. I'm not saying malicious use of them this year, but uh, later on, I would not be surprised if that's what causes a, a global scale catastrophe at all. Uh, and then there are other things like even if we get many of these conditions right and we mitigate those risks, there, there are still things like human factors that affect um, the safety of these organizations. Um, do they have a quote unquote security mindset? Are they doing appropriate horizon scanning of potential failure modes? Are they thinking about uh uh, the difference between safety and capabilities and trying to push distinctly on safety and not just dressing up some capabilities advance as safety. All those things uh, matter pretty substantially for uh, whether this turns out well. So it's a very multifaceted problem. So from the evolutionary view, uh, which approaches are you most excited about? And pe- perhaps which approaches are undervalued currently? I think on the technical front, I think those are largely, as long as we have intense competition pressures, a lot of the technical work is, I think, largely buying yourself time. Maybe um, maybe not that much. Um, I think that actually what's probably going to need to happen is clear a clear idea of what risk looks like, convincing the public more and key decision makers more um, that these risks are serious. Certainly the technical work helps address a lot of other risks and it helps make these sort of selfish behaviors that they acquire be more controlled. As long as we have extraordinarily strong pressure, uh, extraordinarily strong competition pressures, I don't think the the marginal safety improvements that we'll be having um, will really measure up. Uh, So we're going to need international, unprecedented international cooperation, and we're going to need to slow this sort of thing down uh, and bring the development to a point where the risks are negligible in proceeding. This is just at least with respect to the evolutionary uh, view. It's, it's, a, it's a broader societal problem there. But there are still other things like the potentially just controlling an individual AI agent may be extremely difficult. And um, 
uh, we need technical research to be addressing those sorts of risks. So it, it can the, the prioritization can vary depending on how much one thinks that if you have a competent AI agent, it suddenly wants to take over. How strong of a force do you think that sort of animus dominandi, that sort of will to power um, actually is naturally? Um, and how easily can that be offset through training? Um, um, or it, um, o- overwritten through backprop is is a uh, is a different question, but um, yeah. So, but I guess from an evolutionary bit, the competition pressure is the main is the main variable to be getting rid of. Um, that that'll require um, uh, the main thing there is actually more of a changing the infrastructure, the ecosystem in which they're evolving. That that has to be changed. Otherwise, I think we're mm, pro- it's not going to turn out well. Uh, I would guess. Is there anything you're doing on a on a personal level that in in order to prepare for for the world that that we are um, predicting here, a, a very fast moving world, a world in which it might be difficult to understand what's going on. Um, yeah. Do you have any any techniques or advice for that world? There's always very little um, that I can suggest for this, uh, um, unfortunately, because there's so many unknown unknowns. I, I think generally, um, in the case of malicious use, if there's some bio risk, there are some um, basic things like um, uh, having a, some personal protective equipment or something like that. Uh, for if there's like bioterrorism or something, but um, otherwise, it's a lot harder. Um, yeah, it might not even be a problem where there are these kind of individual solutions where you can prepare. Um, it it might be simply too big to prepare as a, as, as a single person. I think there'd be generic things that could potentially help. If people had a lot of resources, then I think there are things they could do. Like, you know, there might be some locations that might be somewhat safer or something if things ever escalate to some conflict and like having that be accessible. But, they, you know, they, these address a, a smaller fraction of the... Uh, or address some of the scenarios, not the majority of them. I don't know. I think just um, uh, it creates an incentive to work right now seems like still a time where there is some potential um, influence over how things go um, and individuals can make, um, uh, can end up influencing outcomes uh, still. Um, It hasn't, um, the ball has not completely left um, everybody's court and in the hands of, you know, two people. Um, So that's just created more incentives for me to, um, Continue working at the at the um, intensity as I was as a, a graduate student, but um, maybe be liquid with respect to resources or financial resources. Uh, uh, oh well, at least one thing I suppose is not being dour, and I think people um, expressing uh, generally dour or um, uh, very pessimistic views and transmitting those emotions are um, basically not productive or not beneficial compared to, um, we can be realistic about risks, uh, certainly, um, uh, but uh, forcing uh, those on the, on people's attention, it's um, constantly and, um, or training them to have some sort of uh, emotional response or showing some emotional response that's unproductive is probably not something you want people emulating. So I think people should be um, more cautious for how they're, um, Having people who are most concerned about risks basically engaging in self-defeating behavior <laughs> of uh, getting to um, thinking the issues you are and then not doing anything about it or just retreating to do the simplest things of um, reading about it or something like that. This is not the, uh, not, not the, the actions I suggest for people who are really into it necessarily. Great. Dan, thanks for coming on and uh, keep fighting the good fight. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Have a good day.